apologize for not being here. Um, he can only be on the phone for about 30 minutes, but she has to go back to the hospital. So he's asking if he could go out of order and say a few words at the beginning before the state, so we can go back. I, I have no, uh, Mr. Williams, any problem with that? Ms. Lori? No. I have no problem with that. Um, we can start with, um, with Mr. Claypool, if you wish, and then um, he'll have to let me know when he wants to drop off the phone, and hopefully I'll know how to do that because uh, I didn't make the call. My judicial assistant uh, set it up. So uh, do you want to start with that? Um, or at what point do you want to do that, Mr. Claypool? You know, I can do that now. But with the court's permission, I need both for the accommodation by phone and, and, and for allowing me to go first. I've got a medical follow-up for an ultrasound at about 2.15 your time. So I just have a few comments I wanted to be able to make, uh, and then I'll defer to, to my esteemed co-counsel and Mr. Weiner. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Claypool. Great. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, what I'd like to ask the court to, to do is, uh, first of all, take into consideration that uh, Dahlia DiPolito is a human being. I know this case has been highly charged. Uh, the emotions have run high in this case in South Florida for, what, seven or eight years. And what I'm hoping that the court will not do is, is allow emotions in the sentencing hearing to eclipse the, the fact and the human aspect of, of the case. So that's the first thing I'd like to ask the court to consider, because I know at the first uh, sentencing hearing, there were, there, it, it, you know, it, it got into almost like a personal assault on Dahlia DiPolito. But at the end of the day, this case is over. She's a human being as well. Second point I wanted to make, I, I wanted to articulate uh, two or three mitigating factors that I would ask Your Honor to take into consideration. Uh, during both the, the second, uh, second retrial and the third retrial, especially the third retrial, there was, there was clear, unequivocal evidence, of, in my estimation, of destructive evidence by the Boynton Beach Police Department, especially the Chili's tape, the 45 minute encounter. Why is that important in the sentencing hearing? Because I think we established in both trials that, uh, that this investigation was compromised. Now, while the state might get up and say, well, that's, that's not relevant, we had other evidence to, to eclipse the lack of evidence, Your Honor actually gave an instruction, uh, a jury instruction, which I believe was proper at the, at the last trial that indicated that an adverse uh, inference can be drawn from that uh, uh, if, they, if the jury believes there was a destructive evidence. So I'm asking the court to at least take that into consideration as well, that this investigation, in our opinion, it was established in both trials, was compromised to the, the lack of preservation of critical evidence. Uh, third point I want to make, is that I know Mr. Williams uh, made a point uh, in his brief that we you know we got all that they had all the jurors in this case on board, including the uh, and that this is pretty much a slam dunk. And I'd like to respectfully remind the court that in the second retrial, as a mitigating factor, uh, you know we we we've gone down, or gone down this road before, but we had a hung jury, and we actually had those alternates in our camp, and that was a vote of five to three for the, uh, for an acquittal on behalf of Dahlia, Dahlia DiPolito. And I think that is a factor that should be considered as mitigating because this isn't this isn't a monster that the state is portraying. Uh, this isn't a, you know, close your eyes, slam dunk uh, case as borne out by the hung jury uh, in the second uh, retrial. So, so th that jury did struggle with whether, uh, with whether uh, Ms. DiPolito were, was culpable uh, for this crime. So I hope that the court would, would consider uh, that as well. And um, a couple of the last points, uh, uh, I know we've talked about this a lot, but I do feel like the unequivocal evidence of both pretrials of the cops TV show filming during this investigation, uh, that many witnesses testified that that clearly compromised the integrity of the investigation, that People end up acting differently because their camera's filming. And I would just ask the court, uh, or Your Honor, to have it in his heart to consider that, that fact as well. Uh, and that leads me to uh, one other uh, quick point, which is, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk made in, in the state brief about how Ms. DiPolito, uh, you know, she was determined to have her husband, Mike, killed, and, you know, she, she was destined to do this. And the fact of the matter is this, Your Honor, I think we've established in both the second and third retrial that, 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 the, that the majority, I think almost all 
of, of the phone calls uh, uh, initiated in the Sunder Kavarat investigation were done by uh, either uh, Mr. Shahade uh, or, or Rudy John. And I believe that the, the handful of phone calls that Mr. Alito initiated to either Mohammed um, um, Shahade or Rudy John were return phone calls. Some people might think that's not important, but I'm asking the court to consider that as a mitigating factor in sentencing Ms. Bibolito, because it's always been my opinion in this case that absent the involvement and the initiating and the, and the instigating of the phone calls by undercover law enforcement, that this crime uh, would have never been committed. And the court was, in the last retrial did allow the evidence of this, this alleged evidence of the um, the Riviera Beach scenario, uh, you know, that Mr. Polito allegedly was trying to talk to somebody else. Well, ironically, that was five or six months before this undercover operation took place. So the fact that nothing happened at all by Mr. Polito to try to do anything to have Mr. Polito killed during that five to six month in our time period, I think should be considered uh, as a mitigating factor alone. At the end of the day, Your Honor, I really believe the evidence in this case has shown both the second and third retrial that absent law enforcement involvement in, in initiating and escalating this, this undercover operation, that this crime would have never been committed. And I ask the court to consider that um, uh, as, as a uh, mitigating factor. And the last point I wanted to make, Ron, I told you I tried to brief, is I would like the court to consider the evidence of both the second and third retrial that at the time that the Boynton Beach PD did intervene, uh, this Dippolito was in a vulnerable state of mind. Again, and I made it clear in both trials, I never, I never preached to anybody that Dowie Dippolito is a choir girl, or we weren't asking anybody to feel sorry for her. Or that she's, you know, she's a, a superb person in the community. I've never said that. But one fact that I think was clear in both, both the second and third retrial was that at the point that Muhammad Shahad, Shahadi reached out to the Boynton Beach PD, he, he never wavered in his testimony that he that that that, that Dalia Dipolita was in a home or state of mind. She said, you know, either I want to die or or Mike wants to die. And I, I think that fact should be uh, uh, considered as a, as a mitigating factor. We're not trying to make an excuse for what happened here, but I, I, I think the state of mind of Dalia Dipolito at the time uh, should be considered as, as, as a mitigating factor. And the last point that I forgot to make is uh, the, 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 the issue that Mr. Williams went into in his brief about all the text messages between Mike Stanley and Dalia Dipolito. The court admitted uh, a lot of those text messages in, in, in the third uh, retrial. And the only point I want to make about those, Your Honor, is I, you know, Dalia Dipolito was not on trial for harassment. Uh, her husband trying to make his life miserable, and and, and certainly we're not condoning those text messages, but there, there was nothing in those slew of text messages that indicated that Dahlia uh, had wanted to have her husband killed, uh, and, and I do think that's an important fact um, uh, or, or a mitigating factor that I, that I would ask that Your Honor uh, take into consideration in the sentencing of Dahlia de Polito. Uh, with that said, Your Honor, I do appreciate um, your time and allowing me to speak to this issue. Thank you. All right, Mr. Claypool, is it appropriate now to disconnect you from the phone, or do you want to continue to listen? Uh, I'd like to continue to listen for about uh, 15, 20 minutes, Your Honor. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to have to have some kind of signal which doesn't interrupt me, at least doesn't um, interrupt what's going on, to let me know when you're going to hang up. Sure. So um, just give me a quick word when you've reached that point. All right. You bet. Thank okay, you. Um, a couple of preliminaries before we get started. Uh, let me deal with probably the only things that the parties will agree on in this entire sentencing hearing. First is, the, I've been told I want to confirm that the jail credit that Ms. DiPolito would be due with respect to any uh, sentence would be 163 days, is that correct? Um, actually, pardon me, yes, 163. 163, Mr. Williams, is that correct? I think you guys stipulated it was 163. Sorry, I'll be making an argument later to why she should be getting credit for I understand. I'm not foreclosing any argument, but I'm gun saying club, yes, yeah. gun club days are 163. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. 
One other thing I want to do before we get started. Has the state prepared the score sheet? I'm assuming you have. I'm required to sign it at some point. <laughs> And the question I'm going to ask, so you're ready for it, um, has the defense reviewed the score sheet and do you believe the score sheet to be accurate as prepared by the state? I haven't received a new score sheet from them. Um, the one from 2011 I have, and it's not quite accurate. Uh, they have the primary offense solicitation in the first degree murder with a firearm. The, with the firearm is not. I don't think it, yeah, I don't it think doesn't really. change your story, but yeah, it shouldn't no because it doesn't effect. matter. There's no such crime. Correct, but there's no finding of fact on the jury that the firearm wasn't involved. Yeah, it's, it's only significant for 1020 life, which doesn't apply here. Um, so you're printing a new score sheet? Yes, sir. Sorry. Okay, well, w when you get it printed, we can proceed, but I want to make sure there's no disagreement about the score sheet. Just a couple more preliminary comments before we get started, just so I understand. Uh, where we're at the score sheet, as I understand it, reflects a score of 48 months. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. All right. Um, and in terms of, um, I usually ask what are the parties asking for right up front. Mm -hmm. I already know because you filed sentencing memoranda. My understanding is state is seeking 30 years. My understanding is that the defense is seeking two years. That's from reading with the downward departure. That's from my reading of the sentencing memoranda. Am I correct? I think we're up two years followed by probation. Okay. But in terms of DOC, you're proposing two years, state is seeking 30. Is that correct? Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to let the state begin. So, Mr. Williams, um, I understand what you're asking for. I'm going to give the opportunity to tell me why. And if there's any witnesses you want to call, just let me know. Yes, is that the score sheet? Yes. Did you show it to Mr. Rosenberg? This is correct. Okay. Yeah, you heard most of this throughout the trial already. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm familiar with the evidence. Uh, just, I, I highlighted a few things in the text messages that you may have heard of my stand. So July 25th, uh, 11, 7 o'clock time, o'clock at night, she texts him, soulmates is what we are. We are meant to be together. Remember, we went to the 
in the case of what? It's evidence in the case. Yes, Your Honor, what allowed me for a limited purpose to establish context. Um, like I said, the state did not put forth substantial evidence for these, and under the Georgia rule, she wasn't allowed to. Okay, there's an opinion out of the fourth DCA that actually interpreting Norville, which says this evidence can be considered in sentencing. It is part of the evidence of trial. Any of the evidence presented at trial is part of the record and can be considered. So I'm going to go over the objection. Your Honor, Your Honor, Brian Clayful on a cell phone call. At this time, I wanted to inform you that I'm going to be uh, uh, terminating my end of the phone call so I don't want to interrupt Mr. Williams. Okay, Mr. Williams, give me one second as I hang up this phone. Okay, Mr. Clayful, we're going to sure. hang up the phone. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Your Honor. Where, where does this come from? Is this the statement? He testified to this in trial. 
Yeah, I believe I heard this. This was the statement that was used for impeachment purposes. Sure, you can argue that and argue we testified to introducing new evidence that wasn't presented in the trial. Was it in Mr. Williams saying Mr. Shihadi testified to? Well, it wasn't for the, this was not played at trial because it was used for impeachment <laughs> purposes. Thing, this wasn't introduced, this actual video. This way, again, just summarize what he said. I, I, I Trust me, I know the evidence in this case. August 1st, 2009, 4.15 p.m. August 1st, 2009, 4.15 p.m.
third guy, the other one, is the one because he wanted to help with some sort of. Well, then when you walk.
because I don't want to. No, I'm not going to, you know, I'm a lot tougher than what I look. I know you're oh, right. thinking. I'm like, oh, I keep on going, whatever. <laughs> you know, but I'm not. You're right. 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 You're He's leaving on Wednesday? He's leaving Wednesday. What time is he leaving Wednesday? He's leaving at 8, he's leaving at 8.30 in the morning. Okay. That's why I wanted to know, like, do you want to come to my house Wednesday, or do you just want to, you know what I mean? I don't know what kind of thing you do, whatever. He's going to be going to the bank on Wednesday. I don't know if, you know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's public for you or no, what's, you. what's it going to be. You can't have to pull out money for his second partner. Oh, he's not going to, okay, so he doesn't have any money at the house, bro? He's, he's like hard, hard cash. He's okay. going and pulling out the money because he has to make it look like it's coming from an account from his business partner. Okay. Business How much money? Um, he's pulling out. Like, I think around ten. Am I even uh, that's 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 what I was telling you. Okay. He's going right. into the bank on Wednesday and he's pulling out money. Like I know what bank he's going to. What bank is he going to? Boca. Are you familiar with Boca? Okay, fine. I know exactly what you're going to be doing, and I know what time it's going to be there. And I'll be there early. He'll be there when the bank opens. All right, what's the name of the bank going to? So, the bank that he's going to, he's going to make a friend. And Boca? Yeah, I know exactly where, what time, everything. Okay. So, I don't know if, you know, well, the problem sure. with this, though, is that from where the bank is to where the partner's office is, it's literally, like, next door to each other. Okay, but you're so going to have to get back in the car to go there. I know where the office is at and everything like that. Like I can show you where everything's at. It's office department. Yeah. All right. Now. But now I don't know if that's like too public for you or. Well, I mean, yeah, I could, you know, I could do it like that, but it is public. I'll get the money. But the thing about it is that it's a hard to get away. If it's in both, how close is it from like I nine five or something? You're closer to the car The bank is. Think of the map. What yeah. road is it on? Four forty one. Four forty one. Close to there. Two bucks to two. Because, you know, I need, I need somewhere to get out fast. Right. Okay. Uh, turn high, what road is it on? It's on Glaze 441. Where is it? 441. Bank of America. Bank of America. And they're in a shop. Bank of America. Where is Glaze's partner's office at? This is 441. This is Glaze. 441 is here. The bank is here. And then the next building over on 441 is where the partner's office is. Okay, so the part of the office is actually hard for yeah, not great. Exactly. What's the name of like, uh, business? It's in a building. Like, I can get you the building number and everything like that. I know where everything's at, but like the exact... First floor, second floor, one like, like, floor. Okay, all right. You want to make it to the building. And he's, he's leaving the house by 8, 8.30. He's going to go get $10,000. Yeah. All right. At that bank, though, he's leaving our house and then going to Bogan. That's where I thought that might be. What kind of car does he drive? Um, I'll probably be in that Tahoe right there. What, well, it says Tahoe? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. I'll probably be in that Tahoe, and he has, a, he has a porch, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be in that Tahoe. Okay. And he just had surgery, so, you know, so I'm pretty sure he'll be in the Tahoe. So I think he might. Okay, all right. So I was thinking that that would benefit you, because obviously, like, you know what I mean? No, either or. The thing is, you know, it's more risky doing it in public like that, but I don't mind. I just got it. Then he'll have it for sure, because the friend texts him, the partner texts to him, you know, when are you coming? Okay. And then from there, I know where he's going right after that. Okay. But he won't have the money anymore. He's going from the bank to there, and then that's it. You're not going to catch him anymore with money. Okay. Well, here's, 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 here's what I'm going to do. If I don't do it now, because, you know, the thing is, I can, you know, I don't want to get greedy, but, you know, the fact that he's going to get $10,000 on him, I'm interested. Exactly. And so we got to... Make it look like, you know, he has more reason to be wild because of that amount of money. Right. Right, and they're probably going to suspect the partner because the only partner knows he's going to get it. Exactly. All right. So what I'm going to do is that, you know, I'm going to try to change my plans a little bit and then try to, you know, do it with the whole bank thing. You know, if, if I can't come through with it by one day, then he's going to have to get the house. You know what I mean? Right. But I'm more interested in, in that additional $10,000 than get from him. You know what I mean? Because, you know, that's not going to come out of your pocket. So what do you mean then? Do you want to go ahead and drive by that area and like scout it out or what are you trying to go? Right now? Yeah.
You know that I advise you your rights, right? Yes, yeah. you Okay. The game's over with. Okay? There's no more games with you and I. Now we're going to get down to serious business. I want to know if you know this guy. Come here. Bring this guy in here. Get over here. Get over here. You know who this guy is? No. You've never seen him before? I've never seen him before. Ever. Do you know her? Put your head up and look at her. Put your head up. I've never seen her. What were you doing coming out of her house? Came out of here. You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. We filmed everything that you did, recorded everything that you did. You're going to jail for solicitation of first degree murder of your husband. I didn't do anything. Did you hear what I just told you? I heard what you said, but I didn't Everything, know listen to me. Everything has been recorded. You were photographed in the convertible when you sat in his car in the front of CVS. What do you want to do? What do you want to do here? I didn't Dying do anything. It? 
listen to me. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail. I didn't do anything. Please, I didn't do anything. Tell me you didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You're going to jail today. As soon as I'm done, they're going to come in here and handcuff you and take you to the Palm Beach County Jail, book you for solicitation of first-degree murder on your husband. Your husband is well and alive. Thank God. Oh, yeah, thank God. No, he doesn't want to see you. He doesn't want to see you. You better quit your plan. Listen to me. I want you to quit your acting and get this over with. Yes, you are. Okay. You know what? You need a real good attorney. You need a real good attorney because we're going to show him the film where you say you're 5,000% sure you want him dead. You think I made that up? You think I made that up? It's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to talk to you. When I leave this room, no other officer will ever talk to you again. The next time we see you is when you're in trial. Now you can make it right here, or you're going to trial, and you're going to do life in prison. You want to cooperate with us? How are you? Good. Um, the state will call Mike Cipollito to the stand. Okay, Mr. Sir, how are you? Good. If you could introduce yourself to the court and spell your last name for the record, please. Uh, Mike DiPolito, D-I-P-P-O-L-I-T-O. And are you the ex-husband of Dahlia DiPolito? Yes. Um, how did the two of you meet? Uh, Actually, let me back up for a second. You're here today at our sentencing. Um, prior to the sentencing, were you given by your lawyer a copy of the sentencing recommendation or memorandum follow filed by the defense? Yes. And um, so do you want to address the court and address a few things that are contained within that? Yeah, it said we met in New York. All right, let me ask you questions from there, okay? Um, how'd you meet the defendant? Uh, I called an escort. She was an escort. Okay. Um, and uh, it says that you met in New York. Where did you actually meet? Uh, Palm Beach County. Judge, does it say that? You can argue when you get back up that it doesn't say what's being said. I'm just going to hear from the victim at this time. So, Before you were married to her, how long after meeting her did you marry her? I believe I met her in October. We were married in February, I believe. So October, November, so a couple months. Before you were married, had you told her about your criminal history and having been to state prison? Yes. And did she know that you were on probation? Yes. Okay. Um, when you guys got together, did you try to change her? No. All right. There's some discussion that you or mentioned that you required or, or had her get breast implants. When were those scheduled? Um, she moved. She moved in with me from California, and probably within the first week or so, she had already had that scheduled. Okay. Did you pay for those? No. So were those done at your direction or her own? I, I didn't know she was doing it until she told me she was doing it. Um, 
I don't want to embarrass you, but I need to ask you some questions. Um, what was your sex life like with the defendant? I thought it was great. Okay. Like, yeah. did you equate it to most young couples who are in love with each other? Listen, when I met her, it, it was very exciting. We got along really well. Our sex life was amazing, and that was part of the whole reason, you know, I was so into her, and I thought she was into me. Okay. Um, there is mention that you forced her into sex. Did you ever force her to have sex with you? Absolutely not. Okay. When... As we know in the facts that you've testified to and we've heard in this trial, um, your money started going missing. When you would question her about that money um, during that time period, you, you testified in the trial that you became, um, started to kind of become agitated of where the money was. Did you lose, begin to lose interest in her sexually at that time? I had so much going on, it was like left and right. And I couldn't keep up with the nonsense going on, and she tried to try to throw some sex at me, and I just sometimes wasn't interested because okay. I couldn't, and I could tell what she was doing, and I just no. Okay. Um, as part of your probation, were you consistently randomly tested for drugs? Yes. To your understanding, did that include steroids? I don't. I don't know. I just would pee in a cup, and they test me. What was your marriage like? What do you think of your marriage? Before all this happened? In, in the beginning, it was great. Like I said, I just said a minute ago, it was exciting. We just met. Um, I didn't meet her in the best circumstance, but we both decided we we're going to move on from that, so we did. And, and I called, so I own part of how I met her. Like, I don't, I don't say it, you know, but point being, we were moving on from that. I had a successful business. Uh, in the beginning, we were excited. Everything was going great. I got to meet her family. We're going there every other day. I read in that thing that I never went there. I read all this nonsense in that pretrial thing that it just didn't make sense. Like, her grandfather was a sick old man. I took the guy to a suite to see a baseball game. We rolled him in in a wheelchair. Okay, let me I mean, ask you a question yeah. about that. There's mention in there that um, basically implies that you wouldn't let her go anywhere or do anything, and she used to be with her family a lot. Did you all do things with her family? Every other day, we would do something. We're going to do this. Let's go. My mom's cooking. Let's go do this. Let's whatever. And honestly, that's part of what, what attracted me to her. It wasn't any. It was the fact that she had a family that she was so close with, and I'm involved with them that fast. It was part of what attracted me to the whole situation. Did her mom live close to you guys? Like two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned you took her family, including her grandfather, who was ill, to a yeah, well, baseball game? Her grandfather didn't speak English. Really, really nice old man, probably the nicest old man I've ever met. And I would sit with him, and I, he couldn't understand me, and I didn't speak Spanish. But we would laugh and get along, and he would watch baseball. So I, I don't know if I asked Dahlia or her sister, I said, and I, but I asked him, have you ever been to a baseball game? He says, no. So I'm like, oh, perfect. So we rented a suite. There was like 15 of us there. So we took the old man because the guy's sick. He was like, you know, I don't know if he, I don't think he was dying then, but he wasn't doing real well. So I went out of my way because I wanted to, I liked this guy. He was, I'm telling you, a really nice old man. And we took him to the game. And like I read in that thing, it was like, I'm a scoundrel. Nobody liked me and I didn't like the family, but I, I, I don't know. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, did you ever abuse her? No. Ever lay a hand on her? Excuse me? Did you ever? Hit her? No. Um, after she was arrested, do you recall her calling you from the Palm Beach County Jail? Yes. Um, have you previously, on several occasions, reviewed that recording? I mean, I've listened to it a few times. Okay, does it accurately and fairly represent the conversation that you had with her from the county jail? Yeah. Okay, Your Honor, at this time, I would ask to publish that to the court. <laughs> Judge, I understand that, but he can authenticate it. True. Well, hold on. This is more of a victim statement, so I'm going to let this in. So it'll be state one over check. Again, I think I heard this also. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to play with you. Honestly. 
I can't help you. I don't even understand what just happened. What is this thing? It's not true. How is that possible? I think I'm sitting here. It's not true. It's not possible. You would need to give me two minutes to talk to you, but it's not possible. What do you think? It's not true. How in the hell did I hear it and see it? I heard what you heard. It's not true. I heard what you heard and I saw what you saw. Everything they showed you, they showed me. And how is it not? How are you telling me that? I am giving you my word that it's not true. Daddy, I couldn't help you if I wanted to. Mike, please, Mike, you're the truth. Can you please help me? It's not true. Your brother was here, and I spoke to him, and he's going to go talk to your mom. I called him for you already. Right? So, everybody, everybody knows where you're at. I know that I need your help. Okay? This is not true. I understand. Wait, bullshit, what's that be? That is, I'm kidding, yeah, I'm 
you're going to have to pay for it. How are you going to tell me that you didn't say it, you didn't do it? When I saw you say it, and I, I saw you do it. Do you have any idea how it was when they told me what supposedly happened to you, how I got it, and how I was, and how everything? Right, and, and you want to do fucking 500 or 5,000 percent of that. That's not true. You're absolutely that's sure, not right? True. I, 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 heard, I heard, I heard what you heard, and that's not true. And what, 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 what did you hear then? I heard the 5,000 percent sure. I heard, um, oh, what else did I hear? I, I heard the whole thing. Everything you heard, I heard. And so not what once. What you hear about I never wanted to say, period. I never paid anybody. I never gave any money. I never so what anything. Did you do for? I didn't fucking do anything. It's what I'm trying to tell you. Why were you exposed to a video camera and fucking tape recorder? Why? Can you meet me in person so I can talk to you? No, I'm not going to meet you in person. Why not? Because you're not going to talk to me. Why? Why the fuck should I? Because you know me. Okay, whenever you need me, I am there for you, period. You know that. Or am I not? You couldn't even get off the couch the other day, and I came, and I brought you dinner, and I this, and I that, and I always make sure that you're always taken no. care of. You're always everything. I never, ever, 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 ever in my wildest dreams ever want that for you, ever. Well, you, you said it. I, no, I, 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 no, I did not say anything. Period. I didn't say anything. I heard you. I didn't say anything. I heard you. You heard it. What the fuck? I heard you say it. How did you not hear it? I mean, how did you not hear it? I heard you. I heard you. I saw you. You know? I saw it. I heard it. I don't understand what you're arguing with me about. And what else did you say to your father to? What did they do? My money? Yeah, it's the papers. What are you talking about? But that's the tea that's down here first. Was that my money tied you right now? No, they're just regular papers. No, they were safety deposit keys. I know what the fuck they look like. Right, and it's not papers. That's it. Well, listen. I don't know how you're going to actually have the nerve to sit here and lie to me now. I don't understand. Like, I fucking heard you say it, Dalia. I saw your fucking mouth do it. Okay? I can't help you even if I wanted to. Do you get it? Why don't you want to? It's out of my fucking head. You're not even trying. It's different if you're trying. You're not even trying. What, what can I possibly do for you? I don't get it. What can I do? You're not even trying. Trying what? I'm fucking sitting there like a diet. Okay, they're getting ready to take me again. That is, I'm going to listen. I'm going to give you some advice and you need to listen. You're going to be lying around in there for a little while, a couple days. You need to just try and fucking relax and fucking just go with it. And keep to yourself and don't say a lot. I can't help you. I, there's nothing I can do to help you. You know? Hello? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know? You know what I'll do? You know what I'll do for you? Seriously? Uh, you sign my house back over to me. I'll help you, Mom. I meant for Give me my house back. That's it. That's it, what? I'll help you. So I don't have to go through the fucking legal fucking bullshit I have to go through already. What does that mean? It means sign my property back to me that you stole, basically. Yeah, that's what you're thinking, and I didn't steal anything. All right, so listen. I'll have the papers sent over to you somehow. You'll sign them over to me, and then I will help your mother. Okay? I'm not signing anything. I know you wouldn't sign anything. I knew that wasn't going to happen. So I can't help you. That's what you're talking about. I'm sitting here watching. You're thinking about. Yeah, you're not having a kill. That's not true. You're a fucking liar. You're a fucking liar. What is your mom saying? She's not saying shit. She's sitting there. What's my mom saying? Check it out. My mom, your mom, fucking everybody's mom's all out of it. You know where you're sitting right now? That's the fucking reality. I can't fix it. 
I just offered to help you, and again, you have the balls to say no to me, okay? But I can't help you. How do I believe you're going to help me if I do that? I, but you know why? Because I'm the only fucking person on the phone that's ever done what they said they were going to do. Me. Okay? And how, do I, how do I believe that? I don't say shit. I just said I'd help you. Okay? You just basically said fuck you to me, which is hilarious considering your situation and considering what the fuck just happened today. Have your mom call me. I'll talk to her about it. I told you what I'd do. I'll fix it. I'll help you. You got to come and do the right thing. All right? Put down anything or put it down. All right. When did you get your house signed back over to you? Uh, I had to wait. So there was the, the first trial at the end. The, uh, her lawyer threw it in my face, acted like he was giving me something. So two years, basically, yeah. almost two years after the fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you first took part in signing that over to her, um, did you do so based on believing the phone calls you'd received were from a true lawyer? Yes. Okay. Um, did you realize you were being frauded at that time? At that time, no. And uh, when you filed for, or when, divor when the divorce was taking place, um, did she contest that divorce to your understanding? Yeah, I, I had a fighter for like three years. It cost me 50 grand in lawyer's fees just to uh, finally have him give me my house because she was fighting fight, fight me for my house. <laughs> yeah. That's all the questions I specifically have for you. If you want to address Judge Kelly and something specific you'd like to say to him. Listen, I've been doing this for, I guess we've been here eight years, and I, I'll be honest, if, if I could hit a button and make this disappear, I would, but I realize that's not life. <laughs> My main thing is, you know, since this has happened, you know, they've done nothing but blame me, the police department, and everybody in the world except say, okay, I did it, whatever. You know, I'm a guy that's been to prison, I got in trouble, I know what it's about. And I said I did it, and I went away. I mean, maybe that's why it means a little more to me. But the point is, you know, and, and not only just my feelings. You know, on national television, I'm a wife beater. I wanted to uh, be on TV. Like, it's just, it's, it's so crazy. And then people will say, yeah, and you're really lucky you're alive. And I'm like, I guess, because I, I can't get to that, because i got to deal with this nonsense for nine years of constant, you know, uh, I didn't do anything, it wasn't me. Everybody talking about how good of a person she is. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, honestly, I'm not here to badmouth this girl, but I'm just talking factual. How, I'm, how I feel about it, I'll be honest, I can't even answer it. I'm so just like, I can't even figure it out. When I read that thing, that, what's it called, the pretrial, whatever today, I, I, they're just, everything and it's a lie. I can't even believe they turned it into you. Like, I couldn't even believe it. Like, I read it today, an hour before I came here, and I was like, kind of at a loss for words. I was like, wow. I can't even believe they turned this into the judge. You know? Um, I, I get the sense everybody gets what I'm saying. I, this is just like, I'm sitting here today, and this is like, this isn't even real. Like, we're still sitting here acting like this girl didn't do this. Like, they're acting like that. It's amazing. It just blows me away. Like, I can't even believe it. But, you know, it affected my life. I, my mom's half a nut job over this. It probably cost me a few hundred grand. I've lost business over this. I almost was thrown in jail from her trying to violate my probation, which somehow, like magic, I made my way out, you know? Um, the girl tried killing me probably three or four times, handed me an iced tea with antifreeze in it, smiled at me. You know, so I mean, but it's whatever. I guess that's it. Like I don't know how to really critique this. I'm, to say I'm I'm not happy, I guess would be, you know, if it would have went another way and she would have owned it. What can I say, right? You know, I guess. But fair that, to sum it up by saying that your life will probably never be the same. I I I, get, I don't even know. It's just it, like I said. It just spins around like a fan. You just can't get away from it. But that, that's all. I, I don't want to over-talk it. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Rosenfeld, any questions for Mr. Yes. Mr. Judge? Mr. Judge, I'm going to ask you to 
Mr. Blue, I do apologize. I did write New York in the sentencing memorandum uh, that was supposed to be Florida, so you are correct. I apologize for that misstatement of fact. It was a mistake. Um, just a few questions for you. Uh, you previously testified, and this is back on February 18th, 2011, six years ago, um, that you didn't care if she got locked up, you didn't care if she went to Vegas. You remember saying that? Yeah, if she paid me back the money she stole. All right. And we've asked about that, and they numerously laugh at me. Because right. they're not going to pay shit back. Well, you do realize that. <laughs> so, you know. All right, just a couple things. You also said that the money was, just to clarify, paid back in restitution and the house was paid. I don't care if they sent Dahlia on a trip to Vegas and let her go. That was the, yeah. your exact quote to make sure I'm yeah, not was, misquoting uh, you. Five years ago, yeah. Sure, I don't want right. to misquote you here. Um, and with her, if she fixed my mess, they could let her go. I'm fine with that. You're aware of that? I don't recall. All right. And if I showed you a copy of your deposition, would that refresh your recollection? Right. Sure. Can I approach you on it? Yes. Sure. Fixing your mess, say you would eventually be paid back. My house is mine. It was mine less than you put it if you would pay interest or something. Yeah, I must have said it. Okay. Yeah. All right, you speak about the money and not getting that, so let's go through a few things. Um, were you aware from uh, the state attorney's office and Ms. Parker prior to the first trial that Mr. Salnick tried to resolve this case over and over again, and the state's position was no offer? Well, he's saying that she's been doing nothing to fix this, and he's dragged into the mud for eight years now. Well, the objection is relevant. You think it's relevant? How it's <laughs> It's interesting. Every time a uh, state attorney brings up an offer, a defense always argues you shouldn't consider it. And when the defense argues it, it's okay. But what's the relevance of it? The relevance is he's saying that she dragged him through the mud for eight years, which is a complete misconception. I'm going to overrule the objection. Go ahead. Um, so are you aware that she tried over and over again to resolve this case through Mr. Salnick? Uh, and Ms. Parker repeatedly came back and said, um, our offer is no offer. It, it was never about paying me back. So and you just read a deposition where you said it was about. I said, money. not the prosecutor. Well, correct, but I'm I can't sure. solve their problem. I understand, that. <laughs> but you, but you do understand. They never offered me money, hence her. So get it clear. No, you understand <laughs> that Mr. Salnick went to Liz Parker, addressed what could be done, the house, the money, and they said no. They offer. offered nothing, so hence nothing happened, and I'm standing here nine years later. Okay, but it's a yes <laughs> or no question, Mr. DiPolito. Are you? What's aware? the question? Because you're not making any sense. Judge, can I ask you a question, or is he going to go in argumentative back okay, and forth? Everyone just take a step back. Mr. Blair, just listen to his question. Okay. Address the question. question. Well, let me... Uh... One second, Judge. You realize that she said... Ms. Parker to Mr. Salnick that even if um, she paid you back, in addition to paying Mr. DiPolito back the money that she stole from him, relinquishing her rights to the house and granting him a divorce, she bring the information to the state, but there was still no offer in this case. Do you understand that? I, I, you listen, like what I want and what they're going to do and what they offered, none of it happened. So not, I, I don't understand the. For this, sir. No, I'm just saying, like. It, nothing developed because nothing was done. Okay. So I don't know how that didn't or did happen, but I know that we're here nine years later. So. So you're aware she got no offer, and are you also aware that after the second trial, I went to Ms. Parker, now your attorney, um, and asked what it would take to resolve the case that you said paying you back? Okay. You're aware of that? Yeah. And are you aware that I went to the state attorney's office? Uh, again, I'm not objecting relevant. It's improper to sit here and argue. Look, plea offers took place. They didn't take place. This victim is on the stand. She gave two statements to the court. It's completely improper to sit here and argue and ask. Mr. Roosevelt, I'm going to sustain it. They're saying that she, you, you can make that argument. This, 
I'm going to sustain the objection of relevancy as to this witness's testimony. He's the victim in the case. He's here to state his position, how it's affected him. You can argue all you like, although, as I said, it's a paradox because usually when the state does it, defense is objecting about you shouldn't get into negotiations one way or the other. You can argue that all you want. He wasn't personally involved in any of that. No, I understand. The reason why I'm bringing it up, Your Honor, is he's testifying on direct, and I just don't, in no fault to Mr. DiPolito, um, I don't know what he does or does not know that he's sitting here eight years later and he hasn't been paid back, and we have tried. You, you had a check waiting for me? Is that what you're telling me? Again. You have a check for me? I'm sustaining, <laughs> look, we're moving on from this topic. I'm sustaining the objection. This isn't helping me, so sustain. And one other thing, this doesn't have to do with plea negotiations, Judge, but were you aware that um, initially, prior to the first trial from 2009 to 2011, what, I assume you're aware there was divorce proceedings going on? I don't understand your timeline. All right. What, 2009 what? to 2011 before trial. Before? Uh, she got charged before, before she was charged. Yeah, she was arrested before. Okay, after she was arrested. Trial. Okay. Yes. Um, that before trial, Mr. Salnick, with no promises, no strings attached, um, sent an email to your then attorney saying she wants to give you the house back. She's not getting anything for it, no strings attached, no promises, anything. Yeah, that was before sentencing. So it would look good. <laughs> and you're aware that there was a quick, quick claim deed sent to you on June 10, 2000, to your attorney, June 10, 2011, by Mr. Salmi, signed by Mr. Bolito, giving you the house back for nothing. Um, no promises. I got the house back when it was we were doing this that day. Salmi threw it in my face. Yeah, cost me 50 grand and a divorce too. So you could have just gave it to me. You realize he sent it. He actually sent this to your but attorney. But I had it thrown in my face here. So okay. I don't know if he sent it to me or didn't. That's how I received it. So. And we're starting yeah. to see an email from Mr. Salnick to... Uh, if you say you sent it, I believe it. i just telling you I don't recall it. I recall the paper being thrown in my face, though. All right, and you did get your house back. Yes. And Ms. Dipolito received nothing for it, no promises, threats, anything. Or no, no threats, no promises, excuse me. Why would she? Okay. Um, no strings attached. And you also admitted at the third trial that you were um, hiding money through her to, so probation didn't know how much money you had. I didn't say that. I said Dahlia was holding some of my money. I didn't say I was hiding money from probation. I didn't say that. You said that probation did not know how much you, you... They weren't aware of my income specifically, no. But I didn't say I was squirreling money through Dahlia to hide it from them. All right, and you actually <laughs> gave her cash in a cashier's check in her name to put in her name to get the house. Yes. So you didn't want probation to know how much income you had? What does this have to do with anything? <laughs> I'm not trying to attack his character, Judge. What's the question even make any fucking sense? Mr. Dippolito, <laughs> Mr. Dippolito, hold on. First of all, we're going to quit talking over each other. I'm not retrying this case, guys. I've, I've tried this case twice. I told you. If there's another trial, it won't be me sitting here. All right? So the objection sustained. Let's move on. It's a victim statement. Listen to the question. Answer as best you can. If there's an objection interposed, everyone be quiet until I hear the objection as written. Now let's proceed, Mr. Dippolito. One moment, Your Honor. All right, but the last thing I'll reiterate is that she did give you the house back, no strings attached? Uh, I received my house, yes. All right, but she got nothing, nothing for it, didn't ask for anything for it, didn't ask the state for a better deal. Wasn't owed anything for it, so she got nothing for it. Okay. <laughs> nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Dippolito. Redirect. Mr. Dippolito, you did your time, right? When you committed your crime? Yes. You want to see her do the same? Yes. I have another question. All right, Mr. Dippolito, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. I'm just. 
further witnesses? Okay. Um, why don't I hear, go ahead and hear all the witnesses, then I can hear argument. I think that's probably the way to go. So let me um, then turn to the defense. Mr. Roosevelt, I want to hear any evidence you want to present. So um, call your first witness. First of all, I apologize in advance, Judge. It's been a pretty long 18 months. I know we're all pretty burnt out at this point from consistent litigation, and um, it's been exhausting for all of us, and I didn't foresee myself being um, up here 18 months later pleading for my client's mercy. So if I'm a little out of it and exhausted, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, we don't have any witnesses. Um, I have advised my client um, to not speak to the court. That's my advice, Judge. Well, me. I assume, well, that's your advice. That's fine. I'm, I, if there's an appeal that's going to be taken, I'm, I can understand that. So. And there is, Judge, as you're so I, you, In other words, but just for the record, I just want to be clear, your client has the right of allocution. Yes. She does not wish to exercise that right based on advice of counsel. Yes, right? Your Honor. Okay. And unfortunately, um, we do have, Ms. Debolito has significant family here in court and friends. Um, you know, also, uh, actually, over my advice, and I completely understand, um, Rhonda Muhammad, her mother, and Samira Muhammad uh, will not be testifying at this point for health reasons and emotional reasons. Uh, Ms. Muhammad simply cannot get up there. Both um, Ms. Dipolito, my client, and Ms. Muhammad are incredibly concerned. Uh, this has been eight years of uh, mental anguish and torture for you know both of them and their families and they don't think they can emotionally or physically handle speaking again so I'd ask to rely on their previous testimony at the previous sentencing hearing obviously I would like to have them up there but I can't uh, I mean that's your call Mr. Rosenfeld and, and the call of your client if I have I want to just real quickly judge if I have concerns about uh, family members help and they express that to me. There's not much I can do about it, but I would like to read letters they wrote in lieu of their testimony. Well, that's fine. I, mean, I was just going to ask, if you're not going to, if you don't want to take testimony, do, do you want to put on the record anything else? That's yes. Uh, they, they just had uh, a letter they each asked me to read rather than them. That's fine. Um, the first letter is from Rhonda Muhammad, uh, Dahlia's mom. Uh, Honorable Judge Kelly, my name is Rhonda Muhammad, Dahlia's mother, and I am writing this letter on behalf of her sentencing. As you know, we have been going through this situation for the last eight years. Not only has this been difficult, but the fact that I am a single mother who does not have the support of a husband or father in this situation really makes it all the more unbearable. It has been very painful, sad, and hard to understand why we have to go through situations like this. Even though we raise our kids setting up good examples and guiding them the proper way. Dahlia was always a family oriented, caring and honest person. Because she was the oldest, she had to help a lot with her young brother and sister after I got divorced. She would always worry about everything in the house. Every morning I wake up thinking this is a nightmare. The media has taken over our privacy our lives have been completely destroyed by comments or assumptions that everyone thinks is the truth. The media does not really know who Dahlia DiPolito was before she was arrested. Everyone has judged her based on those videos or calls. She was obviously at the wrong place at the wrong time and got involved with the wrong people. I am not excusing for her actions or words said in the videos. Even myself am horrified because she never used this kind of language in our, in our home. 
All I know is that people that she met, like Michael DiPolito, were not the right people for her. I never approved of him before being with her. There was something very peculiar about their relationship together. I had horrible feelings as a mother, knowing that he was her husband. She dated two nice and stable guys before Michael. Both relationships lasted several years, and there were never any unpleasant situations or feelings about hostility until Michael DiPolito came into her life. Your Honor, my daughter made a mistake, just as all of us in our lives have made before. We all at one point have been through something we regret, no matter who we are now. We all have the right to have another chance and opportunity in life. She has never been involved in any kind of trouble before. She has complied with all the regulations while being on house arrest. On the occasions when she was given permission to leave the house, she has shown that she is not a danger to anyone or a flight risk. On the other hand, she has shown that during this process, instead of making things up about herself, she has lent a helping hand to others who are encountering various difficult situations. This process has already been a life-changing experience for Dahlia. She needed this wake-up call from God in order to escape the treacherous life she was heading towards with the wrong people. She has grown as a person and matured into a sensitive and compassionate woman. She has developed a mothering nature towards her sweet little baby boy, whom she adores. There is nothing more painful to a mother than to know you will never be able to observe your child's milestones in life. Babies are born into this world with so pure and innocent, without able to verbalize comprehension of their surroundings. However, I know this baby is hurting by not having his mother around to take care of him. Thank you for the time to read this letter. I am begging you to please have consideration in this situation and also consider her faithful and compliant time on house arrest. I know that as a man of God, he will grant you the wisdom to make the right decision. And next, Your Honor, from Samir Muhammad, um, Dahlia's sister. The Honorable Judge Glenn Kelly. My name is Samira Muhammad. I am the sister of Dahlia DiPolito. This letter is being written in regards to her sentencing. I'm going to address in this letter positive aspects of Dahlia's character and also how the sentence is going to affect many people in her life. You and I both know how much the media is involved in this case. They have done anything and everything possible to make sure that everything and everyone in this county, or pardon me, country, knows who Dahlia DiPolito is and the hard crime that she's being charged for. News reporters have been involved from the beginning, and it's interesting because instead of trying to find out who Dahlia really is and how she got in this situation to begin with, they are more preoccupied with slandering and tarnish the reputation of a 30-year-old woman with no prior record. Throughout these past eight years on house arrest, I have spent every single day with her and have gotten to see how much she has grown and how much her character has matured. She has become a God-fearing woman who puts others before herself and always tries to ensure everyone around her is content. As many of our loved ones are writing these letters to you, we are not asking you to forget about the past. We know the law is the law, and as citizens, we all must abide by it. However, we are asking you to consider the present and the future. She is now a mother to an innocent, beautiful baby boy and has exhibited character traits of humility, compassion, selflessness, faithfulness, and kindness. She has shown within these past eight years that she is not a harm to herself or others around her. She has also complied with every single regulation set for her on house arrest and never once thought to do otherwise. I understand, Your Honor, that there is a lot of pressure on you to make a decision, which may or may not be an easy one for you, and I respect that decision. Although the media feels that she shouldn't receive any leniency, I am asking that you consider the long-term effects of this decision. More people in the situation are going to be broken and damaged if she is sentenced to prison. Her son will grow up without a mother. I will grow up without a single, pardon me, a sister by my side. My mother will lose her daughter, and etc. Although we were blessed enough to have her home for all of these years, our family has suffered every single day as a repercussion for past actions. Please, I humbly ask you to contemplate all of this before making your decision. If there is one big thing I have learned from all of this, it's this. At the end of the day, it's not about the way that people perceive us to be. 
It's all about the way our hearts are and about the way God sees us. I thank you so much for taking your time to read my letters and the letters written by those who have been here to support us. I know it must be tedious by now, but we are eternally grateful. God bless Samir Muhammad. And Judge, there are countless other letters from 2017 that I have um, provided your honor with before and the, pardon me, as attachments to uh, my sentencing memorandum. I would just move these into evidence as Defense Exhibit 1, Judge. Any objection to Defense Exhibit 1? All right, Defense Exhibit 1 and evidence without objection. I'm assuming it's the same, same package that yes, you Your honor. sent to me. And in regard to the 2011 letters, there's also countless letters that are attached. There's just one I'd like to read and the rest, I'm sure Your Honor has reviewed. Um, and this is from Mr. Santana, um, who was her first boyfriend. I discussed him um, in the sentencing memorandum. They dated for four years um, and remained friends afterward. Um, he was a uh, U.S. Marine. Unfortunately, he could not make it today, but I think this letter is very informative about Ms. DiPolito's character. And this is obviously made out to the Honorable Judge Colbath, not Your Honor. This is from 2011. Thank you for the opportunity you have provided me in expressing myself on the character of Dalia DiPolito. I am a former Marine who has served honorably in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom Noble Eagle after the devastating collapse of the World Trade Center. During my well-respected career, I have faced many dangerous encounters and malicious people. I can assure you, Your Honor, Dahlia is neither of these. The high-profile case has cost Dahlia her freedom, which is the most valuable right one has. I write this letter to tell you about a wonderful person known as Dahlia, the only person that I have been so close to that I can call her family my family. I advised Dahlia that with time, the truth would be on her side. From the facts presented on her behalf, I just don't understand how this could have happened. Besides her family, I know Dahlia the best. She is a wonderful person who has been supportive of me through hard times. We were in a relationship for six years. And even after our relationship was over, we remained friends. I have known Dahlia for 11 years total. I am well qualified to state on her moral character Honorable Judge Colbath, and I guess now the Honorable Judge Kelly, uh, Dahlia is nothing short of a wonderful human being. She took care of me during a combat-related injury I sustained while serving in the war. Dahlia was supportive of me during harsh times and always believed in me. Dahlia encouraged and supported the military men and women who fight for freedom and defend the Constitution of our country. She and I would go to numerous military functions, and she always reminded me of how proud she was of me and to my sacrifice for our nation. Even when I lost time, at times when I lost hope in myself, she would believe in me and remind me that she would always be there. <clears throat> Dahlia has been a caring and loving person. She took good care of her grandmother, which she cherished greatly. Dahlia helped her mother often, who was a single mother raising two children at the time. Dahlia has shown great devotion to my family and welcomes everyone with open arms. While we lived together, Dahlia stressed the importance of family and would gladly accept to take care of her sister and even my nephew multiple times. Dahlia enjoyed the role as a caretaker of children, wanting them to stay over and entertain them. <clears throat> Dahlia and I have even talked about adopting a child as we believed that there are those in life who shouldn't be raised without a family. Dahlia loved children and has always been affectionate toward them. Dahlia has always talked about helping the needy and doing charity work. She truly believes that it's always better to give than to receive. There are not many people that I can say this about, but Dahlia gives unselfishly. She gives from the heart. Dahlia goes out of her way for others and goes even further for the ones she loves. It's a shame that the media has misreported and represented Dahlia, thus tainting her name to the public, which she knows so little about her. I know Dahlia to be a conservative, self-respecting young woman who was adored by everyone. She is well-liked due to her personality and friendly persona. Honorable Judge Colbath, I beg of you to understand that Dahlia is not the person she has been represented by the media or the prosecution in this case. 
Honorable Judge Colbath, if you have getting tripped up on that, it's a horrific situation. Your Honor, I can assure you that Dahlia is one of the friendliest and kindest persons I have ever known. And Judge, there are also in this packet countless other letters that are attached to the um, sentencing memorandum. I enter this in evidence as defense exhibit two. Any objection to two? Defense two and evidence without objection. Yeah, but I believe it's attached to the exhibit. It is. I mean, I entered that into evidence as defense exhibit three. Any objection to three? And defense finally, three and evidence without objection. And finally, this is also attached, but um, the historical history of Dahlia DiPolito prepared by um, Sheila Cronin as defense exhibit four. Mitigation specialist? Yes, Your Honor. Any, is that four? Yes, Judge. Any objection to four? And four and evidence without objection. not having the best luck right now with health on our side, Judge. I mean, I have a few other exhibits I'm going to ask the court to take judicial notice of that I'm going to need for purposes of argument. Right. So I don't know if Your Honor would permit me to introduce them then, just so we're not going back and forth. What do you, what do you want to introduce? Um, a few uh, news articles that Your Honor obviously can take judicial notice of under the rules um, pertaining to some comp cases, some representative cases. The ones that were covered in your yes, your honor, memorandum? and your honor obviously can take judicial notice and allow me to introduce them into evidence. All right. Well, let me find out whether there's any objection. Um, any objection to me taking judicial notice of the news articles that support the statements made in the sentencing memorandum with respect to other cases? That goes, that goes to uh, weight, not admissibility. As Your Honor knows, you can take judicial notice of news articles, and Your Honor can take them for what they're worth. The state can argue what they just argued during. Mr. Fiore, I don't necessarily disagree with you, um, but I'm going to overrule the objection. I will consider them for what they're worth. It would go to weight and credibility, so they're more weight than anything else. Now or you can hang on to them. I'm, are we ready to get to argument? Well, I'm going to be, introdu I'm going to be introducing them into evidence. I don't know procedurally how you'd like me to do that. I don't really care. You can put them in right now. Hold on to them for a moment, and, and uh, Attorney Van Ask, you make your argument if you want. This is the articles you're talking about, or what else you're talking about? Uh, the articles, um, evidence that was submitted by Mr. Salnick in the first sentencing hearing, that being the quick claim deed, the emails he introduced. Um, where Ms. DiPolito is trying to turn over the property to no strings attached. Um, the emails that were introduced in the first sentencing hearing to Ms. Parker in an attempt to resolve the case. Um, so you're marking these individually and moving them in? Is that what you want to do? I will be judged, yes. So I don't know if procedurally, if you want me to do it now, or I mean, this is your courtroom, your call. It certainly is. 
Okay. Um, what we'll do is uh, just as you as you make the argument, then I'll hear what an objection there is. But I'm, I'm, I guess I'm I'm candidly wondering at what point of the sentencing we are. Are we going to now proceed to argument, and you'll try to raise these issues in your argument? Is that what? what you're yes, Your Honor. So I'll just state argue and then. Right. Okay. Well, the, I'm, it's the sentencing. The state's going to get first and last, Correct. just like they do in trial. So I'll go ahead and start with the state. Hear what they have to say. Ms. Hoy, are you going to start? Hang on just one second, Ms. Hoy. We're ready to proceed, Ms. Rosenthal? Judge, I'm just going to begin by addressing the issue that's raised in Mr. Miles' comments. I'm going to address the government's issues in order of Mr. Um, motion for downward departure. Um, starting on page 19, the need for restitution to Michael Pulido after his release from a prison sentence. Judge, the few quick things I would address on this is that solicitation to commit first degree murder is not a crime um, where restitution is part of it. It's not a theft. It's not you know, a crime where there's damages. Yes, he stole money, but I don't think that it's an appropriate sentence or a remedy in this case. Um, in addition to that, I think it's kind of hard to say that this restitution in this situation it, at the time would have been marital assets. I mean, obviously, it's restitution to his marital assets. So, um, but beyond that, the state would argue that a prison sentence is way more important in this situation than restitution. Just on page one, um, the downward departure based on um, the outrageously conduct. Um, I understand the Stedman case that he cited to. I do think this case is extremely different than Stedman. Stedman was a situation where, I'm sure the court read it, um, where the police were doing undercover drug buys from somebody, and they basically just kept setting this guy up for more and more and more drug buys, um, just solely for the purpose of enhancing his sentencing exposure. And in that situation, the, the appellate court said, yes, we can consider that because but for the police conduct of this continuing pattern behavior, he wouldn't have been facing the amount of time that he was facing. I think this is a, a completely different situation. The argument, obviously, the court ruled on the entrapment issue, and the state argued and argued and argued to the jury about the Boynton Beach Police Department's conduct. I mean, that was basically, obviously, the theory of their case. They discredit all this evidence because of the way that they handled it. And despite their arguments and any evidence that they brought out, the jury found her guilty. Um, I believe that you know the jury discounted that. I don't think that anything that the department did even was done in the, the best way. No. Does it negate her guilt? Absolutely not. Um, we're not here to send it to Boynton Beach Police Department. We're not here to say, well, I'm going to not sentence her as harshly because you should have done things differently. Your job today is to sentence her, not them. I don't think that that should be a reason for departure in this case. Um, the second one, uh, page 23, that she was not a future threat to society. Uh, they're arguing that this is an isolated incident, and I don't know if they're, I mean, they haven't spelled it out that it's a departure under it being isolated on specific Yeah, they listed it as a non-statutory, right. so I'm not sure they're relying on a statutory right. Mm -hmm. I don't think, it, I'm getting that it's not. Um, as far as it being isolated, I, does she have other criminal history? No, but I think this is far from an isolated incident. This court heard numerous amounts of inextricably intertwined evidence of things that she repeatedly did. She took steps to plant drugs on him numerous times, have his probation violated, send him back to prison, taking his money from him. This isn't just some, you went out and you did one crime. She, over months and months and months, plotted and planned and attempted every single way she could to get him out of her life and eliminate him. And when all of her other attempts failed, she tried to hire a hitman to have him killed. So I think it would be, I think, very hard for the court to find that it's an isolated incident incident in that sense. Um, and I think that the court should look at that, that isolated would be somebody made one lapse in judgment. This was not one lapse in judgment. This was a gigantic months and months and months lapse of judgment. The house. Um, being that she gave the house back with no strings attached, she's 
I don't know how they can argue this needs to go to the tax. It wasn't her house. He bought it. He testified at trial. He bought it with his money. Um, I believe it was bought before they were even married, so it wasn't a marital asset. Um, so to sit here and say, well, you got it back with no strings attached or anything else, it, to me is disingenuous. Um, and then to say that, well, he also took part, there's bullet points in here of, of him um, trying to keep it from the probation officer um, and him voluntarily signing that deed. Yes, he did. He did it, though, under the assumption of, quote, unquote, advice from a lawyer that we know from the text messages and the evidence was her ex-boyfriend or her still other lover that was posing as a, a lawyer taking calls to her and him to get all of this done. So I think that this was done under false pretenses um, and it basically was fraud to get it done. Um, and when he did this, obviously he never thought that his wife was going, the woman he loved was gonna attempt to take advantage. Um, so I, I think the house argument Thanks for making that objection. I was aware of just this argument at this point of the sentencing hearing. Yes. Um, as far as the abuse that's talked about and Dr. Walker's report, um, Dr. Walker made these findings. She admitted in her deposition that this court has read, based on other hearings that it's presided over, um, that the information that she relied upon in formulating her opinion was based solely on the defendant's representation. So we have to take those at face value for what they are. Um, and you've heard from Mike DeVito, the victim in this case, was the, the, the person that a jury found to be a victim of this crime, said he never abused her, never laid a hand on her. Um, and, and I would point out to the court that, you know, unfortunately the state can't rebut that evidence because we have no examination of her. Um, as far as their recommended sentence and the arguments that the court should abide by the sentencing guidelines. The sentencing guidelines is the lowest permissible sentence. It is not the sentence that a court must impose. The legislator creates the maximum sentence here, understanding that crimes are all different. Every case has different facts. Every person has different circumstances. And so it gives the court a range. And the legislator clearly felt that this crime was so heinous and so deplorable that someone should be able to serve 30 years in state prison. Four years is just the starting ground that on the most bare bones case that exists of a solicitation, a person should be doing at least four years in state prison. Arguably, this case is far lower uh, from the evidence we've seen of someone, uh, of the defendant who just tried to strip Mike DeBlio of everything he had and then kill him. That doesn't deserve a four-year sentence. And some, although I think it's irrelevant, The state gets up here and says, oh, well, we operated this, and they didn't take it. You know, they're jumping up and down. But then they say, oh, well, this person got all this, so you should sentence to this. Every single case in every court in this country is different. No two cases are alike. No two cases have the same facts. No two cases have the same victim. No two cases have the same defendant. I can't speak for these other cases. I can speak for a few here in Palm Beach County. I can tell you that Ms. Torero's case, to my understanding of it, charges weren't even filed. Um, drastically different situation than what we have here. To my understanding, she was someone who um, had substance abuse problems, multiple different things, and the evidence was not able to prove the charges. Um, Mr. Chambers that happened here, that's a manslaughter case. In that case, Mr. Chambers was a security guard who came home and unfortunately didn't properly secure his firearm and his three-year-old took it and killed himself. And yes, he got probation. 
drastically different situation of someone whose child accidentally killed himself through, through his fault of leaving this gun out is drastically different than that woman who did every act she possibly could to kill her husband. Um, and Aaron Steele, this is a case on here from Palm Beach County, was an accidental shooting where according to probable cause affidavit, the individuals were practicing uh, self-defense, helping try to teach each other self-defense if somebody put a gun to you, thought the gun was unloaded and the person pulled the trigger and it went off. Again, a drastically different situation. And Shelton Miles is an aggravated assault. Um, I, I, I'm not even gonna try to compare the two different charges. Judge, that's our, our arguments against their motion for a downward departure. I just don't see that any of these fit as a valid basis for a downward departure. But even if the court started to try to find different statutory, uh, non-statutory mitigators that applied, a, a departure is not warranted in this case. In, Anyway, she deserves to spend the maximum amount of time she possibly could in state prison. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Gordon. Mr. Rosenfeld? I thought Mr. Williams was going to speak the other mentioned. I think he's doing rebuttal. First of all, Judge, I apologize in advance if I get a little emotional during this sentencing hearing. It's been a bumpy 18 months, and all parties, including the state, uh, have invested, and Your Honor, an excessive amount of time into this, and I think, you know, we're all pretty, uh, pretty worn out. Um, and this one definitely hits close to home. Generally, in my experience in this courtroom and my experience with Your Honor, you see that I'm often very scripted I'm very meticulous in how I go about my presentations. And, you know, I haven't slept much. I um, have sat in front of my computer in tears at times. And for the first time in my career, um, for most of this sentencing memorandum, um, or pardon me, for most of my presentation today, argument, I've been unable to uh, really get my words out and really get them on paper. So there's parts that I wrote down to more or less read to the court, and there's parts that um, I hope will just come out through my heart and through you know how I feel about um, this case, um, Ms. DiPolito's treatment from the beginning, from you know whether it be Boynton Beach, the state attorney's office, the media, um, everybody. Um, my experiences with Ms. DiPolito, uh, my experiences with her uh, tremendous family sitting back there who I've you know, really grown to, you know, think highly of, um, you know, who in time I, I view as family. Uh, they're tremendous, tremendous people. All right. So as stated in this motion, we are moving for a downward departure um, for several reasons, and we'll discuss those in due time. Um, and in the alternative for the CBC recommended score of 48 months in the Department of Corrections with credit for time served. And I wanted to give a reasonable offer. I mean, I, I personally think probation in light of all she's served would be sufficient, but um, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to meet somewhere, Judge. I'm trying to you know, meet somewhere in the middle. Um, as stated in my motion, Ms. DiPolito is a 34-year-old first-time offender who has never in her life been involved in the criminal justice system. She's a loving daughter. I mean, her mother will tell you that. Uh, she's a loving sister. Her sister will tell you that. And more importantly, and most importantly, she's a loving mother. Um, I held her in this courtroom while I heard her scream, and she didn't scream about um, sitting in jail, sitting in prison. All she said was, my baby, my baby. Um, and I think it's fair to say that her life has been nothing short of exemplary. I mean, the state has given you a small piece of her life, and I'm not going to dispute what Ms. Lori says. I'm not going to dispute what Mr. Williams says. I'm not going to dispute what Mr. Ehrenberg back there says or thinks. I mean, they have a case to try. They're doing their job. I respect that. But they're giving you a piece of Ms. DiPolito's life. 
They're giving you, and I'll, I'll go into this more later, they're giving you Ms. Cipollino at the worst moment in her life. And I, I implore you to look past that, Judge. I implore you to look past that. Um, for the past eight years, as we'll discuss later in more detail, she's been confined to a, a townhouse. Her house isn't big, with minimal social interaction for eight years. Um, I mean, she's watched her late 20s, her early 30s pass her by. You know, while some you know, might call house arrest a privilege, I mean, I've heard that term thrown around. I mean, this wasn't your standard house arrest, and your honor knows that. I mean, it's... I mean, not to uh, knock on John Goodman, but this wasn't a John Goodman situation. She wasn't in a mansion, a palatial, you know, house getting tennis lessons and dance lessons and working. She was confined to this small house. Um, she could only go on her back porch. She couldn't go on her driveway. She couldn't go um, in her backyard. She couldn't work. I mean, she could only go see myself um, on limited occasions, and you know, that was due to the workload, um, church twice a week, which uh, we are very grateful for. This court has permitted that and permitted her to grow her spirituality. Um, and medical appointments in court. I mean, it, it's the most restrictive house arrest I've seen. And if there's ever a situation where house arrest comports to incarceration, this would be it. This is as close as it gets. <clears throat> now, despite all this, you know, despite these restrictions, despite everything she's gone through, and I'm not justifying what she's gone through. We're not here to do that, Judge. I'm not, wasn't crossing Mr. DiPolito to justify her actions. I was just trying to paint a bigger picture for you. But despite all this, Mr. DiPolito has utilized this time to secure her faith, bond with her family. Um, her and her mother have become incredibly close. They're inseparable. And grow her family. And people can say what they want about her having a child, but um, she brought a beautiful baby boy into this world, and I commend her for that. Um, and I'll say this again. For those of you who call house arrest a privilege, I mean, I implore these people to sit inside for eight years, sit inside a small townhouse for eight years, only leaving for those limited purposes I listed. Like she just wasn't given those usual privileges on house arrest that makes it, truly makes it a privilege that would have given her more of a sense of purpose and freedom. Um, I recognize that when you're in house, I have clients who are on house arrest who go to work, they're not in their house all day, they're distracted. Um, you look at, um, Raja right now being tried in this courthouse. Um, and taking no position on that case, he goes to work every day. He drops his kids off at school. Now that's a level of freedom that Ms. DiPolito hasn't had. And, I and this court must recognize that there is a huge distinction. Being able to go to work and talk to your friends, your colleagues, I mean, these were his friends and colleagues he worked with. Taking his kids to school, that gives you purpose, that gives you a sense of freedom. And Dahlia never had that. Now, as we all know from the inception, this case has captured the attention of the media. Um, you know, this began with Boyden Beach Police Department's decision to enlist the show cops and their decision through former Chief Imler and funneled through Stephanie Slater to release evidence on YouTube. Dahlia was thrust into the spotlight and became an international sensation. I mean, to this day, I have friends in Australia, um, friends in Iceland, who've said, oh, we saw you know, your case on television. I mean, there's no way about it. She's become an international sensation. And all the while, this sensationalism overshadowed Ms. DiPolito's right to a fair trial. And not by your honor, but just the entirety of the situation. And more importantly, her right to a fair prosecution. I mean, police officers and prosecutors, I mean, have capitalized on this sensationalism in a way I've never seen. <laughs> I mean, whether it be writing a book on it and having a party, or, you know, the career ambitions of Stephanie Slater and, um, you know, Chief Imler and former Sergeant Sheridan. 
Now, I had a bunch of photos and posters to bring in from the party, from the book signing, from, you know, Boynton Beach Police Department podcasts. Left them in my office, Judge. Because I'm not here to, we're here about Dahlia. We're not here about the state attorney's office. These are good people. I know we have our problems at times, but, you know, I've also worked with Ms. Lori. We've gotten along very well at times, Mr. Ehrenberg. Um, even Mr. Williams, we've had our day. We, I'm not here to slander them, or, but there's no way about it that everyone has capitalized on her sensation, on the sensationalism of this case. And through all of this, through all of this, um, and I'd say misguided and often selfish behavior, everyone, every single person has failed to consider how a criminally accused should be treated. I mean, she was not treated like every other client I've, I've ever dealt with. And that's why I took this case. I mean, she was not, from day one, she never had a shot at a fair prosecution. And this, this goes back to the, the McAuliffe era. I mean, this is a, a long, long, long process here. Um, it goes without saying that media and general self-interest have created unique obstacles and have driven her prosecution. Now, as repeated, and I stated this several times in my motion, regardless of what this court sentences her to, I mean, whether it be straight probation and no prison, which, like I said, I think that's what she deserves after what she's been through, um, she'll forever be branded and forever be humiliated in the public eye. And Mr. Bolito has no shot in her normal life. And the state's right, if the true purpose of sentencing is punishment, she'll receive punishment that nobody else receives. She'll go nowhere where people won't say that, hey, it's Dahlia DiPolito. Now, you know, before getting into the grounds for downward departure, I just want to briefly address some issues in the state's motion. You know, and the state has consistently argued uh, throughout the process that um, Mr. DiPolito could have been killed, you know, but for Boynton Beach stepping in. Well, Judge, in our system, we don't punish people for what could have happened. That's why we have different charges. We don't sentence people charged with run-of-the-mill driving under the influence with DUI manslaughter. We don't sentence based on, we don't punish based on possibilities of speculation. That's not our system, that's not how our system was made. And those factors are calculated into the sentencing guidelines. That's why you have scores for certain sentences. Now, the sentence for, and this is the second point in regard to their motion for 30 years, um, I think is just outrageous and disingenuous for several reasons. Um, now, in regard to the actual legal argument, asking the court to give her an even more severe sentence because her previous judge became chief administrative judge isn't her fault. And that's not Ms. DiPolito's fault. I know what the case law says. I've read the state's case law. Um, she shouldn't be punished more harshly for that. And even if he hadn't been appointed chief administrative judge, I think it's fair to say that. That is actually chief judge. Chief judge? Yeah. There are chief judges and there are administrative judges. Chief judge, all right. Even if he hadn't been uh, put in that position as chief judge, I mean, he likely would have had to recuse himself for you know, n comments he made during uh, sentencing. So you know, these are factors that play into Ms. DiPolito getting a new judge, and she shouldn't be punished for that. Now, punishing her for having two or more trials when the state wouldn't resolve the cases pre-trial, and that's not fair. And the state's request for more time is, is utterly disingenuous. We discussed this last Friday when Your Honor brought up the house arrest issue. Um, and I wasn't aware at the time, I wasn't around back in 2011 in Ms. DiPolito's first trial, that the state actually agreed to give her credit for that house arrest. 
So if the state's saying, oh, Ms. DiPolito deserves all this more time now, 20 years was too lenient, then why are they agreeing with a 20-year sentence that, Judge, let's give her a little leniency here and let's give her that time for house arrest. And Mr. Oh, Lawyer, whether they agreed or didn't object, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how that. Regardless, they, I mean, they didn't get up there and start you know, saying, Judge, she's not entitled to this, she deserves the whole 20 years. So to come in here now, after allowing for a more lenient sentence, and saying it's not harsh enough is inherently contradictory and is disingenuous. One moment, Your Honor. Now the state got up there and read text message to you, uh, pardon me, text messages to you, which, um, you know, without question, cast Ms. DiPolito in a very harsh light. Um, you heard him at trial. You heard him at the third trial. You heard him again today. You know, one thing, and Your Honor, you know, made a ruling, and I respect your ruling at the third trial, that Dr. Walker would have testified to is that this is characteristic of a victim of domestic violence in terms of um, a lot of the behavior she was displaying. And I'm referring specifically to uh, this sense of empowerment, of strength. This is an abnormal. The fact that she wasn't telling Mike Stanley, oh, I'm, I'm being abused, does not mean she was not a victim of domestic violence. I mean, it, it's, it's very, I mean, there's um, four types of women, four characteristics they show as victims of domestic violence. And the one Dahlia falls into isn't the passive category, it's the active category. And she would have testified that, obviously not to the facts of this case, but in general, there are four different types. And Dahlia's behavior does not suggest that she was not a victim of domestic violence. Um, one second. Everything about the house uh, is you know, being misinterpreted, and we'll discuss that later on when we get into downward departures. Um, also, um, Hernandez v. State, I'm sure your honor is familiar with that from 2014. Uh, it's a second DCA case, 145 Southern 3rd, 902. And I made an objection before about considering uncharged crimes. I don't have the case in front of me, and I frankly have not shepherdized it since 2014 or key cited it, but that does go to uh, the state considering, uh, the judge considering uncharged offenses. So I said, I quickly pull up the case. I have not shepherdized it. So if it's uh, been distinguished since then, I am not trying to mislead this court. Um, I just found that well. Cabrano v. State. Huh? Cabrano v. State, 4th DCA, 2017. Yeah, I'm not sure if it. No, that stands for the proposition that um, uncharged crimes introduced at trial may be considered at sentencing. The 4th DCA was called upon to address that issue after the Supreme Court's decision in Norville, which seemed to restrict, not seemed, it did restrict what courts can consider at sentencing. But any of the evidence presented at trial, whether it's inextricably intertwined or Williams rule evidence, because the evidence was presented at trial may be considered at sentencing. Okay. Ironically, they were both Castamacus's cases, but anyway. Fair enough. Um, and I think the, I think Ms. Laurie misinterpreted um, the purpose of the case is that I, um, the other solicitation cases that I did present, and I'm going to go into those in more detail, but I wasn't bringing those up for the purposes that she addressed. Um, I was bringing those up for the arbitrariness of sentencing through the guidelines, and we'll get to that later on in my argument. All right, now. Just to speak briefly about Ms. DiPolito's background, and I know, you know, Your Honor has read the sentencing mitigation report and read my, uh, my lengthy motion for downward departure and memorandum, um, but I mean, Dahlia hasn't had it easy. I mean, there's no two ways about it. She's had a tough life. Um, 
you know, we could always say, oh, well, another defendant went through this, but you have to look at each defendant individually and see what they've been through. And Dahlia has not had it easy. Um, you know, she has a loving mother. She had a father who did not care for her, who was physically and emotionally abusive toward her mother during her childhood. Um, Dahlia, unfortunately, being the oldest, suffered the most from this. Her sister's considerably younger than her, 12 years younger. Um, so this wasn't as much of a part of her life as it was for Dahlia's life. Um, you know, I write in the memo how Dahlia recalled hearing the screaming, the crying, as her father was uh, abusing her mother as a child. And this is all coming from um, Rhonda Muhammad, not Dahlia, this is her depiction of what happened and what Dahlia went through growing up. Now, as I also mentioned, there were serious cultural differences in Dahlia's household. Her father was Egyptian, had very strict Middle Eastern upbringing, um, viewed women as, to an extent, subservient to men, um, did not treat her the same, didn't care for her, didn't go to her events growing up. She was just a woman, just a girl. And, you know, this neglect necessarily affected Dahlia DiPolito. Um, you know, high school was no different for Dahlia. You know, three years in a row, eight, nine, ten, she was in different schools, lonely, never made friends, was, you know, the victim of her father's strict rules, was always an outcast. And things only got worse for Dahlia. Uh, you know, I, I address this in detail, and I'm not going to go through all the facts of her childhood. But, you know, her father ultimately took things to a next, you know, the next level, started having an affair on her mother, and she was in a situation for two years. And, you know, in hindsight, her mother's related, wishing she did things differently. But, you know, as I don't have children, but as old parents, you know, have told me, they all wish they did things differently, looking back. Um, and Rhonda allowed her husband to have this affair for two years and to live with his girlfriend on the weekends and come home um, during the week. And Dahlia being the oldest, she obviously, you know, her sister being very young and her brother being the boy and going out and getting closer with his friends to get away from this, suffered from this. I mean, she developed this very traumatic view of men as cheaters, users, abusers, and things only escalated. Her father became uh, very physically abusive with um, Dahlia's mother, as you know, Ron has reported to us. Um, you know, fortunately for most of the abuse, Dahlia would only hear it and not see it. But Dahlia would see her mother with nosebleeds, with bruises on her body. Um, yet Rhonda still thought that it was best to keep him around for her children. And she regrets this in hindsight, but you know, she made a decision as a parent. She thought it was important to have a father around. And we said, I don't have children, and these decisions must be terribly difficult, especially when, as a mother, you're the victim of domestic violence. Um, <clears throat> Rhonda also reported that Dahlia, that he came in screaming one day, trying to take all their money. He wanted to sell their investment properties, he mashed all their credit cards, was draining their savings account. Um, when she refused to allow him to sell the property, he started trashing the house. He shattered the wedding photo, um, all in front of Dahlia, and he tried to attack her. And Dahlia said, you know, if you go after my mom, I'm going to call the police. You know, I, I can't phrase it better than I did in my motion. This fell on deaf ears. He came back. She witnessed him attack her. He grabbed her by her hair. He grabbed scissors. And he cut, her, he cut a big chunk out of her hair. And I'm, I, I'm sorry, Rhonda, you have to listen to this, but um, and Dahlia called the police. I mean, it's, I, you know, he was arrested. And of course, you know, as a abuser, he held this against Dahlia. He blamed Dahlia for this. Dahlia ruined her life. He didn't take responsibility for his actions. Um, 
he picked her up from school one day, and this to me is just abhorrent. I'm in her car that they had bought her, and he made her listen to a 911 call he got a copy of. Um, and admittedly, admittedly, I couldn't get this evidence, and I cried, and I apologize. But he made her listen to a 911 call of her crying, calling the police. I mean, it's, I, you know, he was arrested, and of course, you know, as a abuser, he held this against Dahlia. He blamed Dahlia for this. Dahlia ruined her life. He didn't take responsibility for his actions. Um, he picked her up from school one day, and this to me is just abhorrent. I'm in her car that they had bought her, and he made her listen to a 911 call he got a copy of. Um, and admittedly, admittedly, I couldn't get this evidence, and I cried, and I apologized. But he made her listen to a 911 call of her crying, calling the police. And then he said, you know what? You ruined my life. I'm taking your car away from you. I mean, I can't imagine how that experience played on her, yet Ron is still in the effort to have a father around and a father figure in her other children's life allowed her father to come over for the occasional dinner. And this guy would come over, the bread would be served, and he'd take the bread, and he'd tell Dahlia, every time, this, this is what I had to eat in prison, and would taunt her and repeatedly blame her <laughs> for helping her mother. <coughs> Got to the point where Dahlia ran away. She got a ride to the airport um, from a friend in school. She <laughs> managed to get on a standby flight and fly to New York. And fortunately for her mother, um, her mother found out about it. Her mother uh, called the police in New York and they were waiting for her there, but she couldn't be in the household anymore. It was, um, you know, it was too much and, you know, I, I'd say I can't imagine, but I can relate to certain experiences Dahlia's gone through, and it's, it's terrible. I mean, you know, we, just taking a break from her history for a second, we look at people in these isolated incidents, and we don't recognize what, you know, what they've been through, what they've gone through, and what's led them to find themselves in these situations, and it doesn't justify it. It doesn't justify someone's actions, but it mitigates it, Judge. And it's an understanding that you that you can now have about how Dahlia ended up where Dahlia ended up. Now, you know, we take a step past that. Um, <clears throat> Adele, her father. against her father. Um, he thinks that her father's good to them and he thinks that they deserve you know, a, a good father. And she, to this day, her mother will say she has kept her mouth shut about what, what she went through and held it in internally because she didn't want, you know, she wanted to give her siblings a chance at having a father. So she kept this in, she held this all in. Now, her father didn't pay much child support Dahlia started working to help her mother. She would pick kids up from school, working at Pier 1. You know, doing what, taking responsibility and trying to help. After being abandoned, after being psychologically abused, abandoned, watching her mother physically abused, watching her mother psychologically abused. Now, after high school, Dahlia went, enrolled in what was, I guess, well before my time as a Floridian, it was Palm Beach Community College. She majored in business and marketing and she met um, who I would consider a war hero, someone who sustained an injury overseas, a Marine, uh, Julian Santana, and had a healthy relationship. Um, her mother, you know, will tell me, I've talked to her about it, um, adored him, Dahlia adored him. Um, he was, 
you know, a tremendous person, um, served our country, took care of Dahlia, she, and she took care, of her, took care of him. And they, through all of this, they maintained a, a friendship. That didn't go away. Um, her family, from what I've been told, has maintained a relationship with him. Um, unfortunately, he suffered post-traumatic stress disorder overseas, and uh, that complicated their relationship, and that ended. <clears throat> Dahlia has remained incredibly close through all of this up until their death with her grandparents. Um, in another very tragic experience Dahlia went through, she was in New York with her mother, um, visiting her aunt and with her grandmother, and her grandmother collapsed in Chinatown coming out of the subway. Uh, Dahlia's grandparents for her as a child were this, her saving grace. She didn't have the support of her father. Her and her mother you know, were very closed off about what was going on. Um, Dahlia did to an extent resent her mother for the living arrangement with her father, but her grandparents were her saving grace. So Dahlia in, um, in New York, her grandmother gets off of the subway in Chinatown and collapses and has a heart attack. Dahlia tries to give her CPR in the presence of her mother, but it was too late. Her grandmother had passed away. Now, I think it was roughly six months after this, and this is a very misleading, um, I guess, part of this case that has been presented, and uh, maybe the state doesn't know the history, I don't know, but Mike Stanley. She met Mike Stanley in Florida. Um, she was at the dinner with her mother, they were at a lounge, and they met Mike Stanley. Her parents really liked Mike Stanley as well. He was you know, a very nice guy. They had a um, healthy relationship. He went to New York. Uh, they, and that was my typo in my sentencing motion judge and sentencing memorandum. And Dahlia would travel to and from New York and he would alternate weekends and come here. He was divorced, um, had a five-year-old child. He had a great re she had a great relationship with his child and they moved to California together. So that's, the, that's what happened. That's where Mike Stanley came from. He wasn't some lover she met while married to Mike DiPolito. She then, after a year, she had trouble finding work. Um, she had a real estate license in Florida. She had trouble getting one in California. <coughs> Having never been apart from her, parent, from her mother uh, and her sister, she was homesick. She came back to Florida. And that's where Mike DiPolito comes in. She met Mike DiPolito. He could slander her in any way he wants, calling her an escort. Uh, uh. And Dahlia does say great things about Mike when she met him. I'm not going to go into all the stuff in the motion about that, but she says wonderful things, and Dahlia's mother and sister say otherwise. They thought something was up with him. Now, I entered into evidence Dr. Walker's report regarding domestic violence, and she did do several tests, and she did determine that Dahlia suffered from battered woman syndrome and PTSD. Now, in regard to Mike DiPolito and domestic violence, I do not want to sit up here and slander Mike DiPolito. That's not my intention. But ultimately, Your Honor has to weigh to some extent what you hear from Mr. DiPolito and you know, make some credibility determinations when determining what was really happening here. So I don't think any of us will ever know what really was going on. I mean, this is a very complicated case. You know, there's so many facets of this case that I think, I don't even know what happened. But I'll tell you, if you didn't see that guy flip out up there and think that's a guy who has a temper problem, He hides it well. This is a man who made his money off of victimizing elderly people. He was a con artist. And to this day, he cons us. He came in here saying, oh, when he met Dahlia, he was a reformed man. Um, he turned his life around. Yet despite that, he was giving her money 
to write a cashier's check in her name so probation didn't know where his money was. And he, can, he could say what he wanted today. You heard his testimony during trial. He had money. He was hiding from probation. He can get up here and lie to the jury, lie to the state, lie to your honor about being a reformed man, but that's not true. That's not who he was. And then for the past eight years, since 2009, since all of this, he's been driving around in sports cars, yet a month before trial, he pays restitution off. Like I'm, and I'm not going to go much further into Mike DiPolito. Because like I said, we're here for Dahlia. We're not here for Mike. But the reason why I'm saying this is that when Mike gets up there and says, I never hit her, you know, she, I, I, there was no domestic violence towards Dahlia DiPolito. I want you to think about the person up there who's saying this stuff. This is not a credible person. This is a con artist who showed what temper he has. And no, probation nowhere in the country tests for testosterone. Now, I've went into detail in my report about the domestic violence she suffered. Um, her mother has talked about it. Uh, Ron has told me, you know, explained to me that, despite what he says, that he generally would not come over. There was an occasion, admittedly, admittedly, at the beginning where he brought her grandfather to a Marlins game, um, but things got progressively worse. And Dahlia ended up with a guy who displayed the same patterns as her father. And that's not uncommon for women, children who watch domestic violence growing up. Uh, during this period when this all happened, uh, in 2009, leading up to her arrest, um, you know, as Mr. DiPolito mentioned, Dahlia's grandfather, Enrique Gonzalez, was dying of terminal cancer. So how this impacted Dahlia during this period, I don't know, but I'm sure it, you know, her grandparents being her saving grace growing up was terrible for her. And it, necessarily affected her emotional health at that time. Now we talked uh, in detail about house arrest and just a little bit about how Dolly has been doing on house arrest, post arrest. I know her mother mentioned that after the arrest, she was very afraid she would kill herself, um, take too many pills, she had grave concerns. But house arrest has been a growing experience for Ms. DiPolito. As I said, she became very spiritual, very active member of her church. Um, She uh, does Bible study. You know, she went from being this free spirit to being this um, devout, devout Christian. And most importantly, Dahlia's son. 14 months ago, Dahlia had a son. And I don't have kids, but from what I've been told from everybody I know, all my friends with children, there's not a greater in the world than bringing a child into this world. Um, you know, her brother, her sister, her mother all indicated that there is, n they have never seen a uh, more rapid and greater change in Dahlia than when she had her child. It gave her purpose in life. It gave her a reason to exist. Through eight years of sitting in her house, doing nothing, she finally had you know, a reason to live. And people can say what they want about her having the child. Um, you know, I'm hoping the state does not bring that up on rebuttal because I have a lot to say about it. But, you know, she made a, she made a decision and that's her decision. She has a constitutional right to choose what she does with her body and um, I respect that. That's, that was up to her. I mean, men have kids all the time in prison throughout the country through conjugal visits. It's not something that's too unique. But the point of all this is Dahlia is a tremendous mother. 
I mean, she lives for that child. Like I said, I, I held her in this courtroom while you know, she just cried, screamed. I don't know where Neil went, but he called me up and told me to come up here to check on her. And there was not a single thing uttered about Dahlia DiPolito that came out of her mouth. It was my baby, my baby, my baby. She called me just repeatedly from jail, day after day after day, asking, when can I see my baby? I mean, it, it, it was every single call was selfless. <clears throat> and the stakes for her son are very high, Judge. I mean, obviously any punishment towards her will punish her son. And you know, I believe that is something this court should consider. Now addressing the argument, and I'll start with the downward departure. First, and I did not include this um, in the motion, but I thought about it earlier on, kind of going through those articles, and that relates to Doreen DePresny, and that was a solicitation case on the West Coast, I believe, Your Honor. And in that case, they found a downward departure based on this being um, an isolated incident, unsophisticated, for which she showed remorse. Now, as a matter of law, the I guess what the state was saying and portraying to this court was, well, this wasn't unsophisticated. Look at the steps she took to have the solicitation carried out. And they went back and discussed probation violations and things like that. But those are unrelated to the actual steps she took to commit this solicitation. That's what matters. And solicitation as a crime necessarily involves planning. It has to. I mean, solicitation is its the intent in solicitation. You, you think a plot out, you plan it, and you execute it. It's not a one-step process. It's not like... Um, Aggravated battery where you get in a fight and someone says, oh, it's, that was an isolated incident. No, solicitation involves planning. So based on the state's argument, the way they presented it, if because there was all this planning behind it, it can't be solicitation, then solicitation could never be an isolated incident. That departure ground could never be applied to isolated incident. Well, are you, I'm a little confused. Are you now arguing that as a I'm adding that as an additional. Because that's a statutory... Correct, Judge, and I'm adding that this is one of a new statutory ground I'm arguing now All right. that you know, I thought of while sitting here and looking at Ms. DeFresne's going through her article again. There are three elements to that. Correct, and the second, Your Honor, is unsophisticated. Um, they could say what they want about the text messages. Like I said, those do not go to, those go to vi probation violations, other things, not this solicitation, the unsophistication of it. Um, I think going to Mohammed Shihade, who you saw Mr. Shihade, um, <laughs> wasn't the most sophisticated plot. This was absolutely no different than Mr. Dufresne's plot um, when she went to someone to kill her husband um, and she would give the $25,000 life insurance policy. There were steps taken there. And that also was clearly unsophisticated based on the granting of that downward departure. And finally, remorse. And remorse is obviously very difficult to establish when someone doesn't allocate to the court. However, I would argue that her actions, um, in particular, um, as Your Honor will see in a little while, her agreeing to turn over her prop, the house to Mike DiPolito with no strings attached prior to sentencing getting nothing out of it is an action that demonstrates remorse. She's saying, I don't want the house, take it. She, they sent over a deed, it wasn't thrown in his face, that's not true. It was mailed over to Guy Fronstein, and I have the emails to establish it from Michael Salmick. Um, you know, the divorce attorneys from 2009 to 2011, there were issues with them not wanting her to do it, but 
that was out of her hands. That wasn't her fault. That was the advice of counsel. And she had Mr. Salnick turn over the house. I don't want it. Uh, they, they didn't say, Ms. Parker, what can I get for doing this? They didn't call her, ask her, turned over the house. So I think your honor can consider that in granting a downward departure as remorse. <clears throat> now, the second statutory ground for downward departure would be the need for payment of restitution to Michael DiPolito. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Michael DiPolito just paid off a substantial sum to finally pay off his probation. And obviously, in determining this statutory factor, you need to make a finding that there is actually a need, that Michael DiPolito needs this money. It's not just, oh, it would be nice for him to have the restitution money back. It's he needs the money. So in light of the fact that he could not pay this off until a month before trial, clearly he didn't have the money. And he just paid off the money he had. So I think common logic says now he doesn't have money and he needs money. So I think he does have a need for money. Now you're required to balance that against the need for a prison sentence. Um, I think punishing Ms. DiPolito has been satisfied by eight years of strict home confinement and social humiliation. Um, I added somewhere in my motion that she's also paid $20,000 in house arrest fees. So she's basically been fined $20,000. These are all things this court should consider. So I don't believe there's this excessive need for punishment, and I believe that this need for payment of restitution to Michael DiPolito necessarily outweighs that. <clears throat> now, while we're discussing this, I want to go through Michael DiPolito's deposition testimony um, that we harped on when he testified. When Mr. Soundick asked him, while we're on the subject, is that your desire to see her to go to prison? DiPolito, honestly, no. Mr. Salnick, but if the money was paid in restitution and the house was paid. Mr. Your Honor, he testified to it at the sentencing hearing. I can address what he testified to. They called a witness and that they brought it in. It's, it's testimony of the victim. That's why I allowed in that tape. So I'm going to overrule the objection. I'll consider it for what it's worth. Thank you, Judge. I don't care if they sent Dahlia on a trip to Vegas and let her go. All that does nothing for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't gain nothing by it. I've never said anything about it. And it is already in evidence from Mr. Salnick's um, sentencing hearing, and it's attached to the motion, but I'd move into evidence, Judge, that portion that's attached to the motion. As Defense Exhibit 5, I believe. You're talking about the portion of the transcript? Just the four pages that I attached to the motion. All right. Any objection? Yeah. Same objection. I'm going to overrule the objection, and we'll go in and evidence over objection. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. What's the number? Uh, five. five. I'll admit it is relevant to the argument of downward departure. All right, now, after uh, the second trial, you know, after there being that 3-3 split and the two alternates spoke, you know, I, myself and Mr. Claypool really wanted to resolve this case. Ms. DiPolito did. Nobody wanted a third trial. So I reached out to Ms. Parker. I said, Ms. Parker, what can we do to resolve this? You know, I, I'm sure the state wants Mr. DiPolito's input. And she expressed that he wanted his money. So I had a phone conversation with Brian Fernandez, uh, Craig Williams, and it was mostly between me and Mr. Fernandez. And I said to Mr. Fernandez that, you know, we're gonna look into finding a way to get this restitution. Um, everyone wants this to go away. Um, Liz said, well, his views might have changed because he was dragged through a second trial, which we'll get into later was not, <laughs> not her fault. She didn't get an offer much different than the sentence. And Mr. Fernandez indicated that, and I'm, I don't want to misquote him, but in short, they don't pay to play, which to me is 
nonsense, Judge, because we've, we've all been here and we've all done countless uh, pretrial intervention agreements and probation agreements where you know, restitution or some sort of payment has been the sole special condition, if not one of many special conditions. So moving on from that ground, the second ground for downward departure, I would discuss the non-statutory grounds. And I'm going to start with um, the outrageous pl uh, police misconduct, and that's the Stedman argument. And I'm not disputing the fact that Stedman refers to or deals with a sentence manipulation. Those are the factual issues in Stedman. But the same rationale applies, and just because their use of outrageous police misconduct in Stedman deals with the factual scenario of sentence manipulation, it doesn't mean that the same rationale can't be used for your honor to downward depart from Ms. DiPolito's recommended sentence. Now, Ms. Lurie went into the fact that, oh, well, the jury rejected the police misconduct claims. Well, first of all, we weren't permitted to give an outrageous police misconduct argument to the jury, so it's not really fair to say that they rejected that defense. But for argument's sake, let's say they did. Let's say they rejected that claim. Um, the whole rationale behind Hines, Reif, um, Ty Van Lee, Mathis, um, all these cases is that your honor can consider evidence that is rejected by the jury. So it might not rise to the level of a defense, but your honor still finds that that evidence can be the basis for a downward departure. I mean, that's the point of those cases. I mean, Hines, conduct that is legally insufficient to excuse the defendant's action may nevertheless be legally sufficient to warrant a downward departure sentence. And going on to, I guess it was also in Hines, the trial court can mitigate a sentence based on conduct that is not sufficient to excuse the crime. So, I mean, the state's argument that because the jury rejected our argument is exactly what these cases are saying. Yes, they can reject it and your honor can mitigate because of it. Now, Stedman does address outrageous conduct by the police. And once again, admittedly, this is in a different context. I'm not saying Stedman is spot on, but I'm saying the same rationale applies for your honor to give her a downward departure. And the second district more or less says the conduct of the part of the police, <coughs> which is not sufficient to excuse the defendant's actions as required to support an entrapment defense, may still warrant a downward departure. And I believe that proposition can be drawn from Stedman. And just to give you their rationale, to require a showing of outrageous conduct as a threshold to establishing a sentence manipulation would be to reject the principle entirely because such a showing would amount to entrapment and would constitute a complete defense to the prosecution. However, the conduct in this case did rise to the level necessary for entrapment, <coughs> pardon me, did not rise to the level necessary for entrapment. Nevertheless, conduct which is not sufficient to excuse the defendant's actions may still warrant a downward departure sentence. Now, I want to draw your attention to the motion to dismiss, and actually first the state's comments uh, that there was some, I guess, bad, I don't remember what she, Ms. Lurie said, but some problems with the investigation. Um, Your Honor did point out some problems with Boyden Beach's conduct. And granted, Your Honor did not find that that rose to the level to bar prosecution. And a jury did not find that that rose to the level to um, justify Ms. DiPolito's, or pardon me, that it was not grounds for an acquittal, but Your Honor should consider this in granting a downward departure. And to quote Your, to quote your Honor from the order denying the motion to dismiss, 
The court does acknowledge that while the alleged crime was not manufactured for cops, the presence of a television crew no doubt caused the Boynton Beach Police Department to act in certain respects in a manner which is not consistent with good police practices. And then later on, taking any action in a criminal investigation for the benefit of a TV show or any, for any third party cannot be condoned. The business of law enforcement is enforcement of the laws, not the production of theater. Now to end, and this is your conclusion, summary dismissal of a case for objective entrapment is an extreme remedy, which must be employed with caution. There are portions of this investigation by the Boynton Beach Police Department which are open to legitimate criticism. The police's shortcomings can be exploited at trial to suggest <clears throat> and argue reasonable doubt. However, based on the totality of the circumstances, the actions of the police here are not so outrageous that due process principles would absolutely bar the government from invoking judicial process to obtain a conviction. Now, while the court, like I said, found it didn't bar prosecution and the jury found that it didn't justify an acquittal, I believe that Your Honor can still use this outrageous conduct to, and these shortcomings to mitigate a defense or to mitigate her sentence. Now, by way of example, in Stedman, you have, set, you have manipulation, you have the police doing a drug buy. <coughs> it could stop there. They could arrest the person, it could be over. What do they do? They do another drug buy. Could stop there, they could arrest the defendant, they don't. What do they do? They do a third drug buy. It keeps going and going. <clears throat> now the type of outrageous police misconduct is distinguishable, but here, and this is not a justification for Dalia DiPolito's actions. But here, when Mohammed Shihade <coughs> went into the Boynton Beach Police Department, and as he testified, he thought uh, Ms. DiPolito had no other option other than to kill her husband or kill herself, um, at many points, they could have stopped it, they could have tracked her down, and they could have prevented this. Now, once again, this is not justifying what she did or justifying the solicitation. The jury made a finding, but this mitigates it. And like in Stedman, it could have stopped. And I think with that, Your Honor has the discretion to depart. <clears throat> uh, the next, and this would be the third ground, second in my motion, but third raised today, is that a downward departure is justified because Dalia DiPolito poses no future threat to society. And that's the State v. Sachs, Florida Supreme Court. The court held that a downward departure could be based on a finding that offended posed no future threat to society and that his misconduct was isolated, which was not taken into account by the sentencing guidelines or prohibited by them and was not an element of the offense or of the crime itself. Um, and then State v. Bingham, also cited in the motion, uh, second district stated that the fact that the defendant posed little or no threat or danger to society is a valid reason for a downward departure. Now, State v. Sachs does not say that you have to have both a finding that she poses no threat to society and that it was isolated. It looks at countless factors in there and it points to those two, but I think the focus there, if you, I'm sure your honors read that case before, um, is on that Ms. DiPolito poses no future threat to society. And as I've gone through, Judge, she has lived an impeccable life. Um, she does not pose a danger to the society. Uh, I'd say her level of recidivism is incredibly low, especially now that she's a mother and would never want to face this again. I think having seen her being torn apart from her son in court or knowing she was being torn apart uh, certainly makes her less of a threat to society. And her behavior on house arrest for eight years, which I'll argue was flawless. Yes, Your Honor did technically find one violation. Um, I, I wasn't on the case then, but she was advised by counsel, poorly advised by counsel, to do this interview and that it was okay. Um, I would have argued differently if I'd argued that motion to Your Honor Judge that she was relying on good faith of counsel. And presumably that's why Your Honor didn't take her into custody and we do appreciate that, but 
she was relying on attorneys in making that decision. So in eight years, she's been impeccable on house arrest. Um, and I, I see no evidence whatsoever that she poses a future threat to society. She's done nothing in eight years but abide by this court's conditions. Um, her house arrest officers were very pleased with her, no complaints. Unfortunately, I couldn't track down her house arrest officer who retired for six years, but I know in the first sentencing hearing or bond hearing, uh, it was proffered his ha by Mr. Salnick, um, testimony of the house arrest officer indicating she's been fantastic on house arrest. Uh, next and the last ground for downward departure, and I think this is just in your honor looking at the totality of the circumstances, which I believe you can, and granting a downward departure based on previously stated case law, um, <clears throat> giving the house back. Now, myself, Ms. Lori, Mr. Williams, Mr. DiPolito will never agree on uh, what happened with that house, and I'm not gonna sit here and try to convince your honor what you know, really happened, but you know, just a, a few facts I pointed out in the motion that are very important. Uh, when the house was originally purchased, Mr. DiPolito had Miss DiPolito purchased a cashier's check in her maiden name, and he gave her cash for that. And at the first trial, um, Alex Moreno um, <clears throat> testified that Michael DiPolito told him that certain assets had to be hidden to avoid the probation officer being aware of his assets. And he testified at the third trial that he was hiding assets from his probation officer. So, I mean, this is, this is that, that's what happened. I mean, that, that is, that's all there, Judge. Now, in the, if you look at the totality of the text messages, Mr. Williams read ones that he found to be pertinent, and that's fine. Um, between <clears throat> Dahlia and Mike Stanley, there's a message, and this is important, indicating that Mike DiPolito's concern with the fact that his former partner and business associate had learned that he had a home in his name. He, that was his fear, and if you read the text given to you by the state, you'll find that. And the text said, he was freaking out the other day when he found that his friend knew we owed our, our house, owned, it's written poorly, our house so much, he thought we should put the house in my name. And Todd Serber did not testify at the third trial. He testified at the first trial, and he testified that it was Michael DiPolito's idea to put the house in, their name, in her name and that he found nothing nefarious going on. Now, it's always been, and I'll give your honor evidence of this, Ms. DiPolito's desire to Give this back, and from what I understand, and this is based on you know speaking with Mr. Salnick in his sentencing memorandum, um, Mike DiPolito's divorce, divorce lawyers had stayed the proceedings pending the outcome of the criminal case. So from 2009 to 2011, he says, "Oh, she didn't give me the house back." She couldn't. So she can't be held accountable for doing nothing with the house when his lawyers are saying, "Nope, we're not going to touch it." So she was obviously advised by her divorce attorneys to do nothing, and that's what she did. However, despite advice of her divorce attorneys, um, Mike Salnick sent an email, and I have that here. It's, it was introduced at the first sentencing hearing. I'd like to enter it right now, Judge, and just read from it. Uh, my client was willing to give the back the house prior to trial and still is. I have in my possession a deed, quit claiming the house back to your client. He just needs to sign it and record it. She's getting nothing from it. She'd been trying to give it back. And here's the quit claim deed, Your Honor, signed by her on June 10th, 2011. And we moved this into evidence, Judge. What numbers are they? And I'll find out whether there's an objection. Uh, six and seven, Your Honor. Any objection to six and seven? Okay. I'll overrule the objection, allow six and seven in on mitigation. Yes. Now, while this isn't a separate ground for mitigation, the House, I think, in looking at the totality of the circumstances, um, and as I said earlier, considering it as uh, part of remorse and the statutory ground, I think you can consider that. 
Uh, moving on, if your honor denies all my grounds for downward departure, um, I think that the recommended sentence of 48 months is necessarily the appropriate sentence. Now, I'm going to rely on my motion. I mean, your honors heard me litigate this issue over and over again, or a couple times, that the CPC score is a legislative recommended sentence. Um, the state has their position on it, I have mine. It hasn't reached the appellate court yet, I'm sure at some point it will. But I would say there are no aggravating circumstances that have not already been calculated, calculated into the recommended sentence. Um, all the state this stuff points out are the basis for the solicitation. I mean, if those are aggravating circumstances, then every solicitation has aggravating circumstances because all of them have planning. Solicitation is a crime that involves planning. You know, the state talks about all of this poisoning stuff, and I've spoke to your honor about it. I've read your honor different quotes from Mr. DiPolito about this poisoning. What differs from what he said today? It wasn't until the police brought it up to him that he ever thought about poisoning. He didn't spit it out and say, oh, it didn't taste good. That never happened. I mean, that's a blatant misstatement by Mr. DiPolito. <clears throat> and I would say there are no aggravating factors that are not factored into the score sheet. I mean, we have this piece of paper here, a score sheet, that I think is, you know, especially with Fernandez that came out in 2016, I'd say it's a fundamental right for the court, for a defendant to have uh, your honor have a score sheet and that they should be informed and guided by the score sheet. Obviously, they're not controlled by the score sheet. But I mean, I, I look at this more often than not, not with judges, but very often in plea negotiations as a useless piece of paper, I mean, how it's treated. Like any time you know, we want uh, to go down, people say, oh, no, you're, you're limited by this score sheet. But if it's supposed to be so instructive, then a sentence that so far departs from it, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's, look at the title of it, recommended sentence. <clears throat> and most importantly, Your Honor, I think any recommend, pardon me, any sentence that exceeds the CPC recommendation would as a matter of law, be arbitrary and disparate to another sentence and other sentences imposed under the CPC. And this is the point of bringing in those other cases. I think Ms. Lurie might have uh, misunderstood where I was going with that. And the cases I'll draw your honor's attention to, the first one, famous case, Volusia County, Doreen, I can't pronounce her name, DeFresne, convicted after trial, of solicitation to commit murder for, a, for hiring a hitman to kill her husband because he was leaving her with little money. So tried to hire someone for financial reasons. The trial court in that case granted a downward departure, finding that it was an isolated incident. She had shown remorse and censored a 10 months, a 10 years of probation with no incarceration. Now, I believe the state pointed out that she had drug problems. So drug problems should warrant a 10 month probation to 30 year sentence disparity. That's not a logical argument. But same thing, she wanted her husband killed for financial reasons. Lee County, Kimberly Alters, charged with solicitation to commit first degree murder. Well, she pled guilty to two counts of possession of a controlled substance, <clears throat> one count of possession of a firearm while committing a felony, and she was sentenced to five years probation. And she too avoided a prison sentence. Um, the facts in that case is, as I know them, Judge, were that she approached a confidential informant to hire a hitman in 2010 to kill her husband in exchange for his motorcycle. For his motorcycle. So for the state to say, oh, this is the most gruesome and egregious thing to ever come into this courtroom for a bike. Five years probation. 
Annabelle Gisterrero, Palm Beach County. I believe that was 2011. Um, right around the time, interestingly, 2013, excuse me, of right after Mr. Polito's second trial. You know, I have a police report from that, and unfortunately it's not very useful, so it's about a paragraph. <clears throat> but she was doing undercover work, from what I've read and learned, doing research on the case, for two officers, and she gave those two officers in uniform her credit cards to kill her husband. She gave them credit cards. She actually gave to kill her husband. Uh, there were allegations in that case, like Ms. DiPolito's case of domestic violence. Um, her husband had been arrested, and that case was no filed, the domestic violence charge against her husband. And her case was no filed under, I believe that was McCullough's reign at that point. And my approach with these articles, Judge, they're already entered into evidence. Yes. of a score sheet when you have this much disparity in sentencing. I mean, it makes no sense. Somebody should not be getting 10 months probation and somebody getting 20, 30 years. It, it's, it takes away from the spirit of having a recommended sentence. <clears throat> now, Going through a few things, Judge. You know, I touched on this in the beginning, but I think it's important to address it in this context. I touched on the sensationalism of this case. Uh, the immediate attention it drew from the beginning, whether it be Stephanie Slater, Imler, uh, Paul Sheridan, everyone was capitalizing. Elizabeth Parker in the courtroom wrote a book on it. Um, like I said, I, I had a nice big poster of it to show you, but I'm not okay to embarrass or bash on people. Um, at a party celebrating the signing of a book. I mean, this, there, you know, f from the cops TV show to this party on appeal, it just really overshadowed what was going on here. And there's no way this woman has not been treated differently than other similarly situated defendants. And that's why I'm bringing these other cases that did not draw the same media attention to your honor's attention. Um, she was never treated like any of these women, Doreen, Kimberly, Anna Belkis. I mean, there's no way anyone in this courtroom can sit there and say that this, or pardon me, that the overwhelming media attention in this case did not drive the direction of this prosecution. I mean, from the outset, there was no reasonable efforts to resolve this case. You know, I have the emails, and they were in evidence from the first sentencing hearing between Mike Salnick and Elizabeth Parker, um, where you know, he keeps asking, can we resolve this? Can we resolve this? No offer, no offer. Um, I have you know, the second case, I never got a firm offer. The third case, and I mean, this was the most, I guess, struggling part for me. After the hung jury, we walk out thinking, all right, we can resolve this. Let's sit down and resolve this case. And we get outside and there's you know, a, press con a press release through Mike Edmondson uh, from Mr. Ehrenberg saying we're trying this a third time. I mean, she was never given an opportunity to engage in reasonable plea negotiations. And when I tried to sit down and I tried to resolve the case, I couldn't get an in-person meeting. I get a phone call with Mr. Fernandez and Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams didn't talk, Mr. Fernandez spoke and I spoke and Mr. Claypool added a few things here, you know, here and there. And the offer was, I believe the term was high double digit offer, no credit for house arrest. So this, 
I mean, what incentive did Dalia DiPolito have to resolving this case when her sentence was identical to, or pardon me, her plea offers are identical to <clears throat> what she got in the first trial? I mean, this was, as I put in my motion, an invitation for a second and third trial. I mean, Ms. DiPolito did not, I can assure you, did not want to go to trial once, twice, or three times. I mean, her family, it has been a miserable experience for them. It has been a miserable experience for her. They've been dragged through the media, embarrassed, um, just humiliated. But she hasn't been given an opportunity to resolve this case. And I bring this to your attention, not to um, slander Mr. Williams, Ms. Lori, you know, Mr. Ehrenberg, any of these. I'm not trying to look poorly on any of you, and I hope you know that. Um, I bring this to your attention because we have tried to resolve this case, and Ms. DiPolito has consistently been attacked everywhere. Everything I read, Dahlia DiPolito is making this case being tried a second time, a third time. She's wasting the taxpayers' effing money is what I hear all the time. I mean, this woman did not want to go to trial and never had an opportunity. And I know, Your Honor, I practiced in front of you for years now. I know you wouldn't give a trial tax. But I think it's important for Your Honor to know what has been going on and why we've been here for so many years. And, you know, this is not Dahlia DiPolito. She has not been dragging this on. And I would move my emails that are attached into evidence, Judge, as Mr. Clerk, what are we up to? Eight and nine, Judge? Any objection to eight and nine? Yes, yes Judge. Judge. Same objection. Same objection. I'll overrule the objection. Eight and nine, evidence by objection. Over, over objection, I'm sorry. Yes. And I just want to read one quote from, I put in my memo from Mr. Salnick, and I think he brilliantly predicted what has happened since prior to the first trial. Following sentencing, it is likely this case will be publicized in the national media. Some of the participants in this case may even appear extolling their virtues of obtaining a conviction. That benefits no one in this case except those seeking attention. And he was right. Far too many people have capitalized on the sensational of this case and no one has treated Ms. DiPolito like every other defendant. Now just some final matters, Judge. You know, and finally, uh, this morning, I mentioned earlier, I had trouble putting a pen to paper here and really expressing how I feel about what's going on and, you know, what Ms. DiPolito's been through and what I've been through and her family. And I was able to put some things on paper and it took me quite a few tears and quite a lot of time, but, you know, I think it's important to go through this. And as young lawyers, you know, we're told not to make things, pardon me, make these things personal and bring our personal lives into this. Not to bring our personal lives into the equation. And Judge, I think when you've spent 18 months working with someone day in and day out, I'd almost be inhumane if I didn't. If I didn't speak on behalf of Dahlia DiPolito. I mean, I've spent every waking hour, weekend, and holiday fighting for Dahlia. And, you know, I can go on about the sacrifices I've made, but that's not important, and that's not why we're here. You know, I've made these sacrifices because I truly believe in what I do, and in fact, I love what I do. I get to sit with people like Dahlia DiPolito. I get to know them, and I get to help them. And Dahlia, like all people who come in this courtroom, and especially Dahlia, more so than most of my clients, most people I've met in my life who've done bad things, is not as bad as the worst thing she's done. And I implore you to think about that, Judge. You know, I've had the privilege of getting to know the person Dahlia DiPolito truly is. 
And you know what, that's, I guess, also not important. Why I bring up the sacrifices, Judge, and, you know, just to make this, you know, personal and tie this all together, I've had the extraordinary privilege in my life of marrying a, you know, tremendous woman who understands why I do what I do. And the sacrifices I've made in handling this case are meaningless. The sacrifices she's made not seeing her husband for the first six months of our marriage so I could help someone are truly remarkable and selfless. Now I bring this up for the following reason. I had no idea how Dahlia would fare when this case went to the jury. You know, it's, the jury went, I had no idea what was gonna happen. I obviously hoped for the best. You know, but as a defense attorney, you learn to prepare for the worst. And I asked my wife to drive up from Fort Lauderdale from work. I told her I wanted her support, you know, but in truth, it wasn't for me. It was for my wife. Dahlia and my wife had met briefly in, in court on one or two occasions for seconds, maybe, with the cameras just swarming at our face outside. But I wanted her to meet Dahlia DiPolito. I wanted her to sit down and talk with Dahlia. And I thought she deserved to see who she's made these remarkable sacrifices for. I mean, I watched them in a conference room talking, laughing, and it was, I mean, I'm, I'm tear, it, it was tear jerking, it was heartwarming. Um, you know, these two people, Judge, just sitting there, you know, like any two people in this court, I mean, it was, it was wonderful. And I knew when she walked out of the courtroom, she understood why I wasn't around for six months, why I was barely around for the year before our wedding. And she got to see Dahlia for the person she truly is. And that's the problem, Your Honor. Far too often in our system, we forget that we're dealing with people, with human beings. We look at score sheets, small pieces of a person's life, and case law, we put on these theatrical performances in court. And all the while, we lose sight of what really matters, and that's our humanity. And that goes for me too, Judge. I've said and done things that I'm not proud of, um, and for that, I'm sorry. You know, I've went back and forth with the state attorneys here, the state, um, and I humbly apologize. And I'm sure they've done things to me, and I hope they feel the same way. We've all lost our humanity, but Judge, we can't lose sight of that, especially in sentencing. I mean, let's put aside the cameras and the media that have sensationalized this case from its inception for a moment. Let's forget about the people who waste their time online judging you, judging me, judging Dahlia, judging Craig Williams, Laura Laurie, Dave Ehrenberg. I mean, let's break this down to what this case is really about. You have a 26-year-old girl who you've seen at the worst point in her life, a girl who made an absolutely terrible decision. I mean, the state can use any adjectives they want to describe this girl from eight years ago, but Judge, I assure you, this girl from eight years ago is not Miss Dahlia DiPolito sitting right here. I can promise you that. For eight years, she's been punished terribly for this decision. She sat alone in a, a townhouse, sad, lonely, confused. And as described by one person, and I'll, I won't mention his name, a Boynton Beach Police Department officer, as I promised, he said, she's been standing on a chair with a noose around her neck for the past eight years, having no idea what her fate will be. That's going to weigh on someone, Judge. She's watched the better part of her 20s and 30s pass her by. And regardless of your sentence, she will forever be punished in the public eye. She'll be branded as the girl on the cops TV show. I mean, how much more do we have to punish her? She's done nothing in eight years to suggest she's a danger to society.
And everybody knows that. I mean, you're in a unique, difficult situation. I mean, it's, it's a hard job. You're up there, and you have to determine someone's fate. I mean, you're in a position where you can give her a chance to be a mom, a daughter, a sister. You can give her a chance to make something of her life. And I mean, I implore you, I, I frankly beg you to give her a chance. I mean, I'm done with the theatrics, the cameras in the back, the media, all this. I mean, in the end, it's, it's meaningless when we're dealing with a human being. That's what matters. I'm just, I'm just begging you to look at her as a person. Look at her eyes. If you spent five minutes with her talking, Judge, you would see this woman is not that person. And I'll swear on that. This woman is not that person. And I beg you, look at her as a person. Look at her as a daughter. Look at her as a mother. Thank you, Judge. All right, thank you, Mr. Russell. Uh, Mr. Williams. <coughs> had every ability to flee up to the court if she wanted to flee. The signature going on there was for 30 years. That's what her plea offer was, the maximum under the law. She, you deserve to, Judge, you need to sentence her to protect the rest of society from her. If she wants something, first degree murder is not enough for her. She'll do whatever it takes to get what she wants. Are we at the point in the theaters, Judge? I think we're past that at this point. Show some. Oh, overall, Mr. Rosenfeld, this is their opportunity to tell me why they believe 30 years is appropriate. Is this the same person who was on in-house arrest, who doesn't let the court know she's pregnant, doesn't let in-house no, uh, arrest know she's pregnant, uh, they, they do court orders to try to deceive the court, so she's just going for a regular medical check, but has a child, and then saves I'm it as a- judge. I'm gonna, I ask to be heard on this. She has HIPAA rights, she has no obligation, and if the state is arguing that she is irresponsible for having sex and telling the court when and when she cannot have sex, or whether or not she can have a child. First of all, she has a constitutional right, Judge, to have a child. It, it is her body. She has a constitutional right. She has HIPAA rights. Well, I object to any, any discussion about this well, <laughs> or consideration. I mean, has, anyone, has, has he been to a prison? Mr. Rosenfeld, my turn to speak. All right. We don't have a HIPAA violation. <laughs> Um, I'm saying it would be if she she doesn't have to disclose it. I because. understand your point, Mr. Rosenfeld. We don't have a HIPAA violation here in a sense. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. That, that wasn't. Um, let me ask this, though, uh, Mr. Williams. Um, wh where are you going with the argument with respect to the child? The I, really, I just want to be right up front. The whole goal along was to use it as a weapon in her second trial. That's what was going on. Master manipulator. Okay, if that's your point. That's my point. That point has been articulated, and we could move on. Am I allowed to, to go over evidence that was admitted, admitted in the first trial that um, we didn't admit in our trial that defeats what they're talking about about the home? If it counters an argument that's been made in mis mitigation, yes. It does. Judge, I'd ask to I'd play the, the jail call from the defendant to her mother August 5th. They did.
she's married um, and then to again well, to get guns for him I mean the, it happened from March all the way through till July and then on July 31st um, asking him again to participate in it and this is what he testified to and then basically she tried to lie to officer Robert to detective Robert and say that her husband was beating her and that he was selling drugs in on probation and that there's drugs and struck at the gym every morning and officer Robert asked her many times to come in and see him she wouldn't was all a lie because I even told Robert that she told me that he was where's this, where's this from? Objective? This, this, this is from the sworn it was uh, used in impeachment. It's from a sworn statement by Mr. Shahadi to the officer after the solicitation occurred, as I recall. No, before. This is July 31st. I'm sorry, before. Okay. There was a there, there was a statement before and after. Yes it was. It was used for impeachment. Because I because I even told Officer Robert that she tells me he's the nicest sweetest nerd, but she can't stand him. He would never lay his hands on her from her own mouth. How would he ever know that? But she comes in here and defames every other woman who's a victim of domestic violence by trying to use it as a weapon again like she did her child. Master manipulator. They get up here and talk about these, these ridiculous poisoning claims. We heard from Mr. DiPolito about drinking the, the tainted tea. How would Mohammed Shahadi know on August 10th of 2009 that she poisoned his tea 10 days before? If it, objection, Judge. He said he didn't believe it until he testified to a trial, the third trial. He's using, he's going to refer to Mr. again, Mr. Shahadi's own statement, which was used in impeachment. I what your objection is, Mr. Rosenfeld, but it's overruled. It is. My objection is these are not facts presented at the third trial. Impeach with, with what's about to be read, I believe. I told her when she was asking me about someone to kill him, I said, why don't you just divorce him? Why don't you just figure out some other way? She goes, I tried. I even tried poisoning him. I said, what do you mean by poisoning him? She said, I researched something on the internet about some kind of antifreeze that's odorless, doesn't have a smell, doesn't have a color. And I put it in his tea and he spit it out. And she just told me, that maybe the tea was too concentrated. How long ago was that? Maybe about a week before all this happened, a week, 10 days, or something like that. She told me he took a sip and spit it out. Judge, she's married one month. She's already stolen $100,000, deceived her husband into turning this money over to him get off probation so she can take it and spend it. She buys a truck for a lover of hers and then tries to use that as a weapon for him to manipulate him into having her husband murdered at the time. It was, Judge, when you watch her on those videotapes, it was humorous for her to kill an innocent man in cold blood. She was 
was laughing about it. Unfortunately, she is the one who by her own thoughts and own actions, this is who she is. She's vicious, she's ruthless, she's cruel, she's inhumane, and she's heartless. You will never see a solicitation to commit murder with worse facts than this. She is the worst of the worst, and she deserves the maximum penalty punishable under the law. 30 years in prison. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Well, the state's going to get the last word. So if you've got something you want to say, I'm going to give you the opportunity to sure. say it. But the state's going to get the last word. I, I feel compelled to respond to the baby comment. And, uh, maybe this is my upbringing. My father was a retired infertility specialist. Um, you know, I, I'm just sick of the state throwing this down your throat. I know you won't consider a judge, and you're not going to consider that as manipulation. But aside from her constitutional right to choose what she does with her body, um, Dahlia's not getting any younger. I mean, what happens if she was acquitted and she couldn't have a child? I mean, should she be punished for that? I mean, the fact that the state, without any evidence, gets up here and attacks her for, um, I guess, doing one of the most beautiful things in the world, bringing this child, in, bringing this child into a world, is, I mean, it's kind of despicable, Judge, <laughs> that she uses as a, a sword. She didn't know when her trial was going to go. She didn't know, I mean, I guess I don't have much more to say about it, but it's disheartening that in 2017, you know, with men having babies all the time in prison, Dahlia gets attacked like that in court for choosing what she wants to do with her body. It really, um, it's really distasteful, and I, I know your honor very well. I don't think you'll consider that in sentencing, but I really hope you don't. Look, I mean, it's upsetting. There are two reasonable arguments that can be raised with respect to um, Ms. DiPolito's son. Um, and candidly, I'll tell both of you, <clears throat> I don't know which is true, and it's not going to play much of any of a factor, affect any factor in the sentencing. One position which could be true is that Ms. DiPolito, uh, desiring to be a parent and out of the best of motivations, had a child. That's a reasonable argument. It's also a reasonable argument, um, based on evidence that was presented, um, that she had the child to manipulate the court in a sentence. Both sides could argue those things reasonably from the evidence. Candidly, I don't know what the motivation is, and it's not going to be important with respect to my sentencing. So uh, there are two sides to that argument, um, and I've heard both sides, and that's about all I can say about it. It could go either way. It could be. It was done to manipulate the court with respect to sentencing because it's more difficult, judges being human beings, uh, to sentence a mother than a non-mother. That's true. It also could be that um, she had a true and earnest desire to be a mother, and um, it is a wonderful thing. So, I mean, I, I can't tell which of those two things is true. Um, I can't read minds. I can't read uh, intent and motivation. So. Frankly, um, the child is not going to play a factor in this. It's, it's not something that uh, I need to or want to consider. All right, I appreciate that. And I will say that the child has never been in the courtroom, and Daya would not allow her child to be brought here um, for this hearing. It was her decision. She didn't want the cameras or anyone to um, bother or. That's fine. I'm just, the only thing I'm no, saying, I, Mr. I Roosevelt, there, are, there are two sides to a reasonable argument here, OK? Yes, so. Um, it, both sides can be argued. Candidly, neither side is going to be considered by the court because I, I don't know what motivated it. It could be purest of motives. It could be to manipulate me. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Frankly. Okay. And the last two points I'll make, uh, unrelated, and I didn't bring this up when I was distinguishing the case law, uh, argued by Ms. Lurie, is that in one of the cases, um, in the first trial, he was sentenced to, I believe, 20 or 30 years. It's in my pile back there. Um, for murder, and I believe it was as an accomplice, and then it came back in the second trial that he was the one who actually slit the person's throat. I believe those are the facts, facts that were not known to the judge, and he got 50 years, so it was aggravating facts that came forward. 
Um, and secondly, I'd say in terms of house arrest, um, I think there are situations where Your Honor can consider it as confinement um, based on how restrictive her house arrest was, but irregardless of that, if you can't give her credit for that, I believe you certainly can consider that in imposing a sentence. But I have nothing else, Judge. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. I did say state gets the last word. Anything further, Mr. Williams? Okay. Uh, my turn. Um, my sentence is obviously going to be debated, discussed, um, you know, critiqued, maybe criticized. I don't know. And so I am going to take uh, a little time, a brief period of time, to explain my reasoning and to explain my sentence. And I'm candidly, I'm going to try to put aside as best any human can um, you know, all of the uh, extrinsic factors that have floated around this case, the collateral matters, um, which have had the, you know, made the case more difficult, frankly, from a lot of different perspectives. I'm going to try to set aside that noise, so to speak, to be objective um, and to reach a sentence that I think is appropriate. Probably not surprisingly, um, I don't totally agree with either one of you. Um, and I'll tell you how I disagree um, and where I do agree. Um, with respect to the state's position um, on a sentence that exceeds the prior sentence of 20 years, in other words, a request for a maximum sentence going up to 30 years, um, I believe the state has correctly pointed out that there are exceptions to the presumption of vindictiveness. Generally speaking, under North Carolina versus Pierce, I think the Supreme Court case is that um, if the sentencing judge exceeds a prior sentence after appeal, there is a presumption of vindictiveness. That presumption can be overcome, but it requires evidence demonstrating that the defendant did something between the first sentence and the second sentence. State has correctly pointed out that there is an exception to that where the judge that's sentencing the second time is not the same judge that sentenced the first time, which obviously is the case here. Judge Colbath sentenced the first time, I'm sentencing this time. So there is an exception in my understanding based on the case law that the state gave to me um, that under those circumstances, if the sentence exceeds the prior sentence, there is no presumption of vindictiveness, um, but the defense still has the opportunity to demonstrate actual vindictiveness. I acknowledge that as a legal principle, um, and so I acknowledge that there probably is um, authority for me exceeding the 20-year sentence previously uh, handed down by Judge Colbath. Um, but from my perspective, um, I believe that that would punish Ms. DiPolito for taking an appeal. And so from my own personal perspective, that could be viewed as vindictive. So while I have the legal right to do that, perhaps under the case law that the state has given to me, I believe that the maximum sentence in this case should not exceed the sentence that was imposed by uh, Judge Colbeck. Uh, so that's how I disagree with the state. Uh, with respect to the defense, I have to make a couple of comments concerning um, downward departures, um, and also um, the guideline score sheet in this case. So I'll comment on those two things because from that perspective, I disagree with the defense. First, let me address the downward departure issue. Both sides know it's a two-step test. Um, number one, the court must determine whether the defense has provided sufficient evidence to support a downward departure. That's step one. Step two is regardless of whether or not the defense has in fact met that burden, should the court depart? So it's a two-step process. As I understand it, the defense has raised um, essentially three different grounds, interrelated somewhat, but three different grounds for downward departure. So let me briefly address those. Um, with respect to the first grounds for downward departure, that the need for restitution outweighs the need for punishment. I do not believe that ground for the downward departure um, has been satisfied in this case, or perhaps is even relevant in this case. As pointed out by Ms. Lori, this is not a grand theft. Um, if this were a theft case, um, then perhaps restitution would be primary on everyone's mind. 
This is a solicitation to commit first degree murder. So I do not believe that restitution really is a driving issue in this case. Even to the extent that Mr. DiPolito um, would want uh, restitution, I don't think that need or that desire sitting where I'm sitting would outweigh the need for punishment. So I do not believe that basis for a downward departure exists. Um, with respect to the second statutory grounds for downward departure, my understanding is uh, this wasn't, candidly, this wasn't raised specifically in your motion, Mr. Rosenfeld, but I, I understand that it's the isolated incident, um, unsophisticated, for which the defendant has shown remorse, which is a statutory basis to depart. Um, candidly, I do not believe the evidence supports that ground for downward departure either. Um, I think Candidly, the first element may have been satisfied, isolated incident. I know the argument Ms. Lori raised about the other prior acts leading up to um, the solicitation, um, but it is um, her first charged crime, so there are no other crimes. I think isolated incident may be satisfied. I do not believe that it's been proven that it was unsophisticated, given the evidence and facts in this case. Also, I do not believe that there's been sufficient evidence of um, remorse. I understand the argument. Well, first of all, I understand the handicap if you're not going to allocute because of appeal, so that is a bit of a handicap in raising that issue. But the argument, candidly, that um, she was willing to turn the house back over and that shows remorse, frankly, just doesn't fly with me. That's not something I think um, satisfies that requirement. Um, the last ground you raised is a non-statutory basis, which frankly, if you look at the case law, is pretty wide open with respect to non-statutory grounds. You can argue just about anything um, under that catch-all, um, and it may uh, be a grounds for departure. Um, that ground may have been satisfied here. Um, so I won't say that there's not sufficient evidence to consider that downward departure. But candidly, when you get to the second element, it doesn't matter. And because the second element is, um, even if there was a ground for departure, should the court in its discretion depart? I do not believe the court in its discretion should depart. So there will not be a departure sentence. Commenting briefly on um, the score sheet, obviously this is a debate that I have with state attorneys and defense attorneys every day of the week about what that means. Um, is it a recommended sentence? Is it simply the floor? Mr. Rosenfeld, you thought there might be sometime a case deciding that issue? There never will be, because that's simply an argument with respect to how a court should perceive it. The law is clear um, that absent of grounds for departure, you can't go below it, um, but the law is also clear that you can go all the way up to the statutory max above it. So. That issue is not an issue that's ever going to be decided by an appellate court. It's an argument that attorneys will have in front of judges um, continuously, and it's been made in front of me continuously. My view of it is it's not a recommended sentence. It is, in fact, the floor. It is you cannot go below that um, without uh, grounds for departure. So um, I do not believe it's a recommended sentence in this case, and therefore my discretion is anywhere from the recommended sentence, or not the recommended, but the floor sentence of 48 months all the way up to what I've described as the 20-year cap. I think that is the appropriate range in this case um, based on my view. Um, so let me talk then specifically about my reasoning in terms of uh, the sentence I'm going to impose um, and how I am getting to where I'm ultimately going. I'm going to start with um, an area where I absolutely agree with the state um, in a couple respects. Um, number one, uh, the goal of sentencing is punishment. It's not rehabilitation, and the legislature is clear on that. The goal is punishment. So in this case, uh, the issue is what is the appropriate punishment uh, for Ms. DiPolito, who has been convicted by a jury of solicitation to commit first-degree murder. That is the issue before me. What is the appropriate uh, punishment? I also agree with the state that the circumstances and the evidence in this case um, as a starting point, and let me emphasize as a starting point because the way I'm approaching this is 
I'm looking at the aggravating factors, and then I'm going to consider whatever mitigating factors there may be. But from my perspective, the state is correct that um, this particular crime um, was committed not in an unsophisticated way, but in a sophisticated way, um, in a cold and calculated fashion. Um, there was a plan put in place by Ms. DiPolito uh, to kill Michael DiPolito. The jury so found and the evidence so supports. Um, and it was done in a very cold, as I said, in, in premeditated fashion. The evidence of trial, in fact, suggested that perhaps at the time Ms. DiPolito may have been manipulating up to three different men, um, including Mr. Stanley, Mr. Shaheda, and obviously um, uh, Mr. DiPolito in planning the death of one. So in terms of aggravating factors, the evidence in this case and the manner in which this crime was committed, um, I believe based solely on that, the maximum sentence of 20 years should be imposed but if I didn't consider any mitigating factors. So as a beginning point, I think the state is correct that the maximum sentence um, and of course, I'm defining the maximum sentence as 20 years as opposed to 30 based on the comments I've already made. So as a starting point, I believe um, the, the state is correct that the maximum sentence is appropriate in this case, um, absent any mitigating circumstances. I'll make a brief comment I wasn't going to about uh, Mr. DiPolito. Um, I think Mr. DiPolito's testimony, both at trial and here today, also candidly, um, supports the sentence uh, of 20 years because Mr. DiPolito, there's been a lot of talk about Ms. DiPolito living with this case and certainly she has and I'll comment on that in just a moment, certainly she has, but Mr. DiPolito who is an innocent victim in all of this has suffered through that same eight years and has been caused to come into this courtroom over and over again and to be exposed to the same um, intrusion by the press and by others who are curious um, and so he has suffered through that um, and I know candidly Mr. Rosenfeld I, I, I hear you say that you didn't mean to attack Mr. DiPolito and I'll take you at your word um, but frankly I found his statements compelling to me um, I felt um, he's been honest he was honest I thought at the time of trial although I can't weigh the evidence that's the jury's duty to do it but I can weigh and consider his comments here um, and so, frankly, I think on Mr. DiPolito's behalf, again, that is an aggravating factor. Um, so as a starting point, I think the maximum sentence as defined by the prior uh, sentence by, Mr. by Judge Colbath is, is the correct sentence. However, um, and frankly, it would probably be easier if I just stopped there um, and sentenced as was sentenced before at 20 years. But I don't believe that's appropriate either. I believe I have to objectively on my ha own behalf, not based on what anyone else has done, not based on what anyone else's expectations are, thoughts are, beliefs are, or criticisms that I might receive. I think my job is to objectively consider what I should in terms of mitigating factors. Um, and so I've tried to do that. And so I'm going to consider a few of the mitigating factors with respect to imposing sentence. I'm going to comment on several of the mitigating factors, but I'm going to focus primarily on the two that I think are of any significance. Frankly, there are many mitigating factors I do not believe have much or any weight in terms of my sentence. So let me just comment on them briefly because they've been raised um, over and over and over again in this trial. First of all, and this was raised by Mr. Claypool in his opening remarks uh, when we first started this uh, earlier this afternoon. Um, that the conduct of the Boynton Beach Police Department um, is a mitigating factor. Um, I do not believe it's a mitigating factor. Um, you are correct, Mr. Rosenfeld, when you point out that I did have a few critical remarks uh, to be made about the Boynton Beach Police Department. I also said the remarks by defense in that same order were overblown. Um, I do not believe that law enforcement should be about theater I stand by that comment. Um, and there are a few things that could have been done better in that investigation. But the bottom line is, it's not a mitigating factor because the Boynton Beach Police Department, um, criticize them as you may, um, in this case, probably saved a life. 
It was their investigation. You can be critical of it as you wish, and there are points of it which can be critical. I can see that. Um, but the investigation probably, or more likely, saved the life of Michael DiPolito. Because as I said, the evidence supports the conclusion that Ms. DiPolito had the intent to have her husband killed. Um, that's what the jury found, and that's what the evidence supports. And so I do believe that the investigation, where it may have been flawed in ways, um, did not cause Ms. DiPolito to do anything. There was never any evidence that they induced her to do anything or that anyone induced her to do anything. She did it of her own free will, um, and their conduct cannot be a mitigating factor in this case. Um, one mitigating factor that requires some weight, um, I have taken the time to read every single letter that's been sent to me has been included in the package the defense has sent to me. So anything that's been sent to me concerning um, those individuals who have now interacted with Ms. DiPolito, um, have spoken with her, who believes that she is a different person, that she's matured, that she's now a person of faith. I have read all of those. Um, I believe that is a mitigating factor, although candidly I have to make it a slight mitigating factor because I still have to go back to there's evidence to the contrary as submitted during the course of this trial. I frankly hope that Ms. DiPolito is a changed person. I hope she is a mature person or a more mature person um, and is a person of faith. I think all those things are good. I hope that to be true. Um, but frankly, I can't use that in connection with the sentence in any real meaningful way. Um, another issue that was debated, objected to, discussed ad nauseum, um, with respect to mitigating factors would be the lack of offers or attempts to resolve this case. I cannot consider that to be a mitigating factor. State attorney, as the executive, makes decisions about what cases to prosecute, what cases to offer what in. That's an executive function. It's not the function of the judiciary, unless it's a plea to the court, to get involved in that. And so. Um, they get to make those decisions, just like I get to make my decisions. Um, and whether they choose uh, in any particular case to negotiate or not negotiate um, cannot be, in my view, considered to be a mitigating factor. Um, candidly, the other cases that you presented to me, um, I understand in sentencing in general there can be disparity. Um, but I don't know the facts of those cases. I didn't try those cases. Um, I don't know what those judges were thinking. I mean, candidly, and we all know this is part of the system, um, you know, we have six or seven different judges here in the criminal division. Their sentence might be different in this case, uh, each of us. And so we probably try to bring our own perspective to the sentencing process. So I really can't consider those other uh, cases to be of any you know, mitigating significance. The publicity uh, is something I've considered not because there was publicity, but only in connection with the in-house arrest, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, that's just been the fact of this case from day one. Um, it's an unfortunate fact from the party's perspective um, that that's something that they have to deal with. But as I said, it's not just Ms. DiPolito that's had to deal with it. I understand it's been an extreme factor for her. It's been an extreme factor for Mr. Um, uh, for Mr. DiPolito, for Mohammed Shahadi, um, for the attorneys, candidly for me. I don't enjoy seeing my face on television in Australia any more than anyone else does. Um, and so that's just been a fact of this case, but it can't really be a mitigating factor. There are, however, two things I've considered objectively as mitigating factors. Um, one is, although I do not believe the score sheet um, is the recommended sentence, and I do not believe and disagree that I should sentence to the minimum score sheet sentence in this case. I believe it is a mitigating factor and must be taken into account by any objective judge um, that Ms. DiPolito has no prior record and that's why she scores the way she does. And so I do think I have to take that into account as a mitigating factor. Um, the other significant mitigating factor I have to take into account in this case um, is the time on in-house arrest. So let me comment briefly on that and my perspective on the time on in-house arrest. Obviously, in-house arrest is not the functional equivalent of jail, and therefore there is no entitlement under our law 
to day-for-day -day credit uh, for in-house arrest. In-house arrest is not jail. There's a difference between a townhouse and gun club. Um, and so you can't get day-for-day -day credit. Um, but it is something that can be considered, particularly in a case like this, that is, for various reasons, <laughs> taken so long to reach a conclusion over eight years. Um, and so the time on in-house arrest is something I can consider as a mitigating factor. Parenthetically, uh, the sentence that was previously handed down by Judge Colbath, um, either inadvertently or not, did take that into consideration because the sentence of 20 years was really not a 20-year sentence. It was an 18-year sentence because credit was given for in-house arrest where legally there was really no basis for that. Um, I don't know why that was done, uh, Ms. Lori said, because the state didn't object. That's probably correct. I wasn't there. None of us were here ex there except for Ms. Lori. So for whatever reason, in-house arrest was something that was taken into consideration with respect to uh, the first sentence. Um, and so I believe that I do have to consider, not day for day, but I do have to consider uh, the fact that Ms. DiPolito has been on house arrest for eight years. As I said, it's not the functional equivalent of jail, but it is a restriction on your freedom and your liberty. And so I do need to take that into account in terms of passing um, a sentence. And so my primary mitigators in this case uh, against the 20-year maximum sentence are going to be the in-house arrest time uh, and, frankly, the fact that other than this case, um, she has no prior record. Um, taking, taking into account all of those considerations, my sentence is as follows. My sentence is 16 years in the Department of Corrections uh, with credit for 163 days time served. I'm also required to inform Ms. DiPolito of what she already knows, but I'll inform her because I'm legally required to. You will have 30 days from the date of this sentence and judgment to appeal. Um, I also am required to assess court costs in this case, and I realize it's not significant compared to everything else that's been going on. The court costs in the case are $518. Mr. Rosenfeld, I typically ask how defense wants me to handle court costs. You want it in a judgment? What do you want to do? Um, judgment, Your Honor. All right, we'll place the $518 in judgment. Um, I've explained the best I can why I've done what I've done. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. As I said, I'm sure this sentence will be discussed, debated, criticized, um, and that's okay. It's my job to pass sentence, and that's what I'm doing. So it's 16 years with credit for 163 days time served. Giving credit for about half of the uh, in-house arrest time is the way it works out, because I think absent grounds for mitigation, I agree with the state this is a maximum sentence case, which would have been 20 years under my um, theory of vindictiveness. Is there anything else we need to do before we conclude this sentencing hearing? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. One third of the thing I'm going to put on the record so that it's clear. I think it needs to go on the court event form. Um, at the last hearing, um, Mr. Rosenfeld indicated he would be filing a motion uh, for release on bond pending appeal. Um, since you've indicated that you're going to do that, I'm going to direct the sheriff's office not to transfer. Ms. DiPolito to the Department of Corrections until such time as I've been able to hear, consider, and rule on that motion. Um, so we'll keep her here in Palm Beach County until I've done, I've done that. All right, one last time. Anything further from either side? All right. I just request, and I know it's not your general practice, uh, or most of your general practice, to uh, give a court date for a motion for any motion before they're filed. If I could schedule with judicial assistance. Well, hold on, back up, Mr. President. Here's what we're going to do. You're gonna, you, you need to file your motion, all right? Once your motion is filed, um, is it, I'm assuming the state may wish to have an opportunity to respond to that. All right. How long do you need to respond to um, the motion? I understand, but I got to set some kind of deadlines. <laughs> All right, let's say five days to respond to the motion, and then I'll, um, I will start looking at hearing time. When are, you, when are you leaving and when are you back? You're leaving on August what? August 10th. And when are you back? Not until September, September 3rd, uh, 4th, excuse me. Oh, that's a holiday. Okay. All right, 
the bottom line, Mr. Rosenfeld, is I will um, attempt to set this as timely as I can, but I cannot promise you I'm going to be able to set it before you leave the country because I have a speedy trial, I've got a murder trial after that, and this isn't the only case, believe it or not, that I have to attend to. So um, I will do the best I can to set it during my normal motion week. I certainly won't set it when you're not going to be here, Mr. Rosenfeld, but I, I can't guarantee you it's going to be before August 10th. That, that just depends on a number of circumstances. So, um, and it's, frankly, it's, I'll be candid with you, it's unlikely that's going to occur because of my trial schedule. All right, one last time, anything further? All right, all right, we're in recess. This is not related to Dippolito. Okay. I'm sorry, what, what are you asking? Oh, Mr. Williams, where are you? Um, clerk is indicating there was an exhibit placed in evidence that you have not given them, or you just play it. You didn't place it in evidence. He didn't put it in evidence.